I am so sick of people acting a ghetto plum fool. What are y'all doing out there acting like a bunch of animals beating up the Christmas tree? What did the Christmas tree do, huh? What did the Christmas tree do to get beat up? Out there screaming and yelling and ripping up the Christmas lights. What in the world did the Christmas lights do to y'all, huh? And what is it going to change? Let me know. This is a season of giving, so I'm going to give y'all some advice. While y'all out there acting like a plum fool in the cold, y'all going to mess around and get sick. So stop by your local pharmacy, pick up some meds, and go home and go to bed. And oh, before y'all go to bed, uh, this is a season of sharing, so let me share some info with y'all. Jesus' birthday about to come up, so don't act a fool on my father's birthday, okay? I know that much. Well, good morning. We're out here on Mount Hoos. I was checking the rain gauge. I thought it might be <clears throat> storming up here on the mount, but um, certainly sunny in the valley when I left. But I checked the rain gauge in the hallway, and it's dry as can be. So I guess we're um, we're going to have maybe a dry year. Maybe we didn't even need to fix that spillway up there in Oroville. <clears throat> If you stumble across this, you don't know what you're listening to. This is Live with Lou, and uh, this is Lou Benninger with Santos Vigil here today. And we're going to plug away for three hours till noon. We are speaking live today, so you can call in if you want to. But, I, you know, I've been mentioning that <clears throat> someone stole our Jefferson banner, the second one that's been stolen. Now we got in here this morning, someone stole our live stream box. So we don't have any live stream, I don't think, today. So if you cannot hear us well, just go find something else to do. And then you can go to One Eye Blind Media on YouTube, probably later on tonight or tomorrow. That's One Eye Blind Media on YouTube. And uh, it's a channel on YouTube, and you can click on the listening uh, lists and look for Live with Lou and pick pick the, ch the, uh, sh the uh, show you want to listen to. So uh, one, the part that's missing off that showing, first of all, it's, a, it's a probably a better listening than listening to the radio because it's uh, a recording nice and clear. But uh, they have to scrub out the uh, bumper music, and uh, so some of that's relevant to the show. But because of copyright infringement issues with YouTube, they've got to edit that out. So, but since we don't have live stream today, with no explanation, when you come in here today, you don't know whether the place is going to be open or not. You just kind of come in, and equipment can be missing. Today the water's not on, so we're out here trying to bucket in water in case you need to drink anything or get rid of some water so we're here uh again this is the patriot 1410 a.m kmyc we're out here on mount hooth in east yuba county uh the big the big area called linda and uh, we're just above the cannabis cloud you just get a whiff every once in a while 
So welcome. And uh, we may or may not take your call. They had quite a few calls in the previous show. They had a little contest going on where did Black Bart commit his last crime. So I thought, well, somebody's actually listening this morning. So this last week, uh, some of you may not even pay attention to this, but last week was uh, on December 7. It was <clears throat> the uh, memory uh, um, of, or the memorial Ising of the attack on Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and for those who uh, have forgotten or maybe never really learned much about it, I want to make a few comments about the attack on Pearl Harbor. At that time, um, it was in 1941, and the, uh, the Japanese were taking over uh, areas in the Pacific, and the Germans and the Italians were working together to take over Europe. And at 7.55 a.m., that's in the morning for those out in Oliver and Linda, 7.55 in the morning on Sunday, December 7th, the Japanese felt that at that time in the morning and on, on a weekend, the Americans would be taking it easy, sleeping in, maybe going to church or something like that. And so they chose that specifically. They'd been planning the attack for over one year. And they were a couple of hundred miles uh, off shore and they began to send their planes in, and the attack lasted for about 110 minutes from 7.55 to 9.45. Uh, their airplanes came in two waves, approximately 45 minutes apart, and uh, they hoped to destroy the aircraft carrier fleet, but they missed that fleet. It wasn't sitting where they thought it would be in port. But uh, they, they traveled 230 miles and then began to drop their bombs. They sent four small submarine submarines in also to assist. And uh, anyway, they did a lot of damage. And the Japanese fleet consi consisted of 353 planes. And uh, originally, when they were picked up on radar, uh, like typically of most things like this, is the people operating the radar apparatus mistook the planes as friendly aircraft, as American aircraft, and mis misread it, which many times disasters happen because somebody didn't do their job. And uh, so they attacked various airfields, uh, Hickman, Wheeler, Bellows, Iwa, Schofield, and Kanoe airfields, damaging lots of planes, and they damaged lots of uh, ship, many ships as well. There were, uh, if, if you read up on this, you'll see different numbers, slightly different, but a total of 2,335 U.S. servicemen were killed and 1,143 were wounded. 68 civilians were also killed and 35 wounded. The next day, now we, we wouldn't have done this these days. We wouldn't declare war this quickly, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, declared war the next day. And then right after that, uh, Germany and Italy on December 11th, four days later, declared war on the United States. And so we were in it with both feet. Now, just to compare uh, those losses to the 9-11 attacks on the, on the United States in 2001, September, <clears throat> uh, September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers were hit by uh, terrorists from Al-Qaeda, there were 2,996 people killed, and, of course, many, many, many people damaged from that but of that 2,996 people 343 firefighters and paramedics lost their lives 23 New York City police officers and 37 Port Authority I bring that up because attacks on the homeland of the of America are rare 
and so those are the two prominent ones with the uh, the ones standing out of course for for all these over 70 years uh, on Pearl Harbor as the initiation of the war there was a great in fact you can still see it online at territorial dispatch biz biz you can see a great aerial photograph of the Arizona which and the museum on top of the Arizona the water you can see right through the water to see the ship underwater it's on the front page in color of the territorial dispatch if you're interested in looking at it so that's an important date for me because it triggered my father's uh, joining volunteering for the US Navy and uh, which he spent the rest of the war <clears throat> in the Navy and my uncle going into the Army Air Force so uh, I'm sure a lot of you have memories a lot of times in vet around Veterans Day people uh, post photos of their loved ones that have served in many of the wars that have kept us free they post them on Facebook which I always enjoy looking and looking at them and, and reading about them so uh, for those who served during that terrible war uh, in the Pacific and in Europe uh, we remember you today this uh, show is a show that we've been doing for about five years now maybe it's been pushing six I don't know this is about our anniversary let's see oh, we're past our anniversary I think we started October 18th many years ago as a one-hour show but we're here today three hours and and we actually pay for our own time uh, we're just here on our own we're talking for food Randy Fletcher supervisor fifth district left me a donut to eat here so he's taking care of me for the next three hours he said he got a little queasy coming in today he got a little jittery needed to go down and get some food so he bought the best food in town which is of course donuts and uh, brought them in so that's the first donuts we've seen around here since the fish left I think when the Occupy Wall Street people used to harass us somebody used to bring donuts I don't know whether it was the Occupy people or whether it was the fish sneaking them in like Santa Claus but uh, we're here because of a couple of groups that like to support us and uh, that's the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots and uh, they meet on the first and third Monday night of every month out at the Church of Glad Tidings campus at Eager Road and uh, Highway 99 or you can go out Live Oak Boulevard and get the Eager Road as well they meet at 630 the first and third Monday but since we're in the holiday season and typical of the holidays sometimes your event lands right on top of New Year's or something or Christmas and you got to juggle so uh, their next meeting I believe is January 14 uh, which is the second uh, Monday of uh, January so they're taking a little powder for the for December and the first and the first Monday and so it'll be the third Monday of January the 14th I think it is so uh, the cool thing about the Tea Party Patriots is they are continuing to bring in speakers and discuss what's going on in our community and highlight how far away from the Constitution we're getting and how far away we are uh, from small government responsible government honest government the kind of government that the founders dreamed about and tried to launch and so uh, if you want to do more than just whine about it and moan about it at home get involved with the Tea Party so the other people uh, helping us out here uh, we, we have a couple advertisers uh, Greenitz construction and the plumbing doctor you'll hear about them later but elite security those people and they also run API Academy and so elite universal security if you want a job in the security business or maybe you want to be a dispatcher or maybe you want to just do any of the kind of tasks that they have uh, they got jobs in fact, it, I noticed on their website at EliteUniversalSecurity.com, they got jobs if you want one. So EliteUniversalSecurity.com, or you can go 
and you can go to school out there. You can get all kinds of classes through these guys. It's called the API Academy, api-academy.com, to find out all their different schools, classes that are being conducted off into the future, and you can dip into them, and uh, you can actually get involved, and you don't have to be 18. Classes like on pepper spray, handcuffing, tasers, de-escalation of force, uh, CCW firearms training, guard card training, annual security guard training. Lots of good courses, so uh, check it out. You want a job, or you maybe you think, hey, I'm just I'm getting ready to get out of high school, and I want to go take some courses, and and they may be maybe a lot less expensive than going to Yuba College and getting some of them, or maybe it's too soon for you to go to Yuba College. Dip into those courses and go for it. Or maybe you can't you can't break away from work. Maybe you're working and you can't break away from work. And maybe it's in the middle of the semester, but you want to get in a couple uh, training courses and learn some stuff And uh, before you go to the police academy at Yuba College. So check it out. Well, I, uh, I want to encourage you today, since we don't have live stream again, just mention one eye blind media. And you can later, in several hours after the show, you may be able to go there and listen to the show really clear and at your convenience. One Eye Blind Media on the YouTube. Okay, so I wanted to talk today to begin with about uh, the problem with our government. The reason that the founding fathers wanted a very, very small um federal government just meant they were minimalists they wanted a government that would protect us from foreign invaders and they wanted a government to protect us from one another when our gnarly side came out and so the other day uh i think we were in the jail speaking or we were somewhere and we began to read the passage out of romans 13 which talks about the purpose of government and uh, how it should be funded. And so it said, pay your taxes because you need to take care of the government. And the the government that they were referring to at that time were law enforcement officials. And they said, the reason is, I'll give you the Lou, Lou Benninger paraphrase version, is we need to keep a lid on this sucker because people's sinful tendencies constantly are causing people to do stupid stuff and violate their neighbor, steal from their neighbor, lie about their neighbor, molest their neighbor, uh, have sex with somebody else's woman, assault them, steal cars or steal chariots back then, steal horses, steal a sheep. And so they needed, since people didn't want to do God, God's way, Uh, Our tendency is to just go, even though we know the right thing to do, we do stupid stuff, wrong stuff, sinful stuff. Uh, They needed law enforcement to take care of business. But the founding fathers thought, hey, we need to even keep a, a lid on that. So everybody needs to be packing their own weapons at their home and teach their kids how to shoot them. Did you know that the founding fathers even taught the they said, listen, we want all not, we just don't want mom and dad to know how to use the musket or whatever they were shooting in. But we, we want the kids to be trained because not because they may have to deal with somebody wanting to assault them or steal a donkey, uh, or shoot a deer for meat. It, it was to take arms against the government, which they knew always had a tendency to overrule, stick their nose under our tent mess with us, control every move we make, tax every move they make. And they said at some point you may have to take up arms against the government. That was the reason for the Second Amendment, not hunting, not protecting you against uh, the, the gang member down the corner who's doing stupid stuff. And so what we have today is everything that the founding fathers feared. We don't, you can't make a move in your life without checking in with government or paying government something. I was just uh, vibrating back and forth with my contact, a friend in Vietnam, and he said, 
because yesterday he said, uh, the police called me and they're coming to investigate me. In Vietnam, the police know everything that's going on everywhere. They, they have police about every block. They have someone overseeing a certain turf. <clears throat> and so particularly if you're a Christian, you get investigated a lot. And so he said they notified me that they're coming. So they had to clean up their, their area of Christian materials. So they hauled that out, all that out, so they wouldn't get our stuff. And uh, they came and interrogated him. And they had moved since the last time the police had come and saw, seen them. So they tracked him down and they interrogated him and, and uh, asked him lots of questions. So I said, why didn't you just leave town for a while? Tell them you'll see him in two weeks. They said, Lou, if I told them we were going to leave town and go up to the Central Highlands, they would have said, well, why are you going up there? See, people in America are stupid. They think uh, they have no idea. In fact, I, I was telling my friend in Vietnam, people have no idea what's going on. And I said, people, my friend over there, I told him, people in America actually want to become more like you guys. He said, Lou, they're crazy in America. People are crazy in America. He said, we, people can come to you in your city in Vietnam and tell you to leave. Just leave the city. We don't want you here. You belong in another city. And so that's what government has become. If you notice what's happening is government is bigger and bigger, taking away your rights. And, you, and if it isn't a law to eliminate your rights, then they create a permit process where they control your rights. So, for instance, they may not take away your gun, but then they say, well, you have to have a permit to get a gun, to have a gun, a concealed gun says nothing like that in the constitution they just made that up extra now uh, i was just reading last night in a magazine that one of the listeners recommended to me a number of years ago called range it's everybody ought to be reading it. it's called range and it's talking about how the bureau of land management has come in and uh under obama has been taking water rights away from farmers that have been on that ground from the 1800s before the bureau of land management even was a thought in a legislator's mind and they're now coming in taking away the water rights and then bankrupting ranches and farmers throughout the West so constantly government wants to grow bigger how do they how do they get bigger because they create some kind of crisis and then they think well we need to hire a person to oversee that crisis like they created the homeless crisis in Yuba County and Sutter County and then they we hired a homeless czar uh, and paid her seventy eighty thousand dollars a year and then we created a homeless camp called Bendorf Zoo next to the rescue mission and paid a few hundred thousand more dollars so we just constantly expand government I'm gonna go over that today because there's an article in the Appeal Democrat in yesterday morning's paper by Jake Abbott talking about that public safety officials are claiming we're running out of money and we're not going to be able to save your life, damn it. Because we're just we're just running out of money. Are we out of time? We got we got one more minute. So this is the same story we heard a couple of years ago from the city of Marysville, which is a big crock of crap, and they lied to us, but they lied smooth enough with the backing of Roy Lanza and David Lanza's money doing the public relations scam that a bunch of you in Marysville voted for it. So now we pay an extra 1% sales tax. We're up to eight, eight and a half percent. And now the, now the County of Yuba is going to ask us to add taxes probably on our property and sales because they claim we just have been working our fingers to the bone, managing every little red cent as they used to call it. And we just, we just can't find enough dollars to protect you. So please come to a meeting next week to help us think this through. The fact is they've already got it figured out. It's a big bunch of public relations BS. And, uh, and they got Sheriff Durfer and Chief Webb snookered into this. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about the rest of it and it's going to get gnarly. So hang on.
right after we take a break. Are you content being a slave of California government? I'm Randy Thomason with your SaveCalifornia.com Minute. You're already suffering from too high gas taxes. You'll be hit with higher DMV fees starting in January. Then you'll see another hike when California's more expensive summer blend of gas kicks in. And if the price of oil increases, you'll pay even more. Obviously, we must repeal the corrupt and unnecessary tax and fee hikes of the Democrat politicians. And we must stop them from doing it again. That's why I'm happy that a constitutional amendment has been filed and approved for signatures. Its language is solid. But to have a realistic chance, this gas tax repeal needs a conservative multimillionaire to pay for professional signature gathering. See more at SaveCalifornia.com. Fighting the good fight for your values in California. Bringing new meaning to the term first responders. Fellow community members stepping forward, volunteering their time to help others faced with what might be some of the most traumatic incidents in their lives. It's called the Trauma Intervention Program, or TIP. It's been used in communities across the United States for years, and its volunteers have been dispatched to provide what they call emotional first aid. A collaboration between police, paramedics, fire departments, and even hospital staff is making sure residents are emotionally taken care of in a time of crisis. Residents are volunteering their time with the Trauma Intervention Program, or TIP, dispatched to the scene of a fire, accident, or death to focus on the emotional needs of those left behind. It's just being there and being comforting, like a good friend or an extension of your family. Ready to assist, sit, and listen to community members in a time of tragedy. To learn more about the Trauma Intervention Program, visit yubasuttertip.org or call 673-9300. Hello, Liberty-loving patriots. This is Chrissy Ann Hall, Liberty's lobbyist and founder of Liberty First University. You're listening to Live with Lou on KMYC 1410 AM, The Patriot. The founding fathers and mothers didn't pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor so we could sit around and rest on their laurels. They expected us to exercise our God-given rights and to practice eternal vigilance to monitor and hold accountable our fellow citizens to whom we delegate power. The federal government is not the supreme law of the land. The Constitution is. To learn more about the Constitution and to help Lou and me get the word out about how our founders truly wanted this republic to operate, visit me at chrisannhall.com and at Liberty First University. In the crude mathematics of murder, communism must be reckoned the most lethal ideology ever devised by human intelligence. The transatlantic slave trade killed maybe 10 million people. The Nazis maybe murdered 17 million. Communism globally killed 100 million people. Some shot into pits, some arrested at night and taken off to gulags, some starved as state policy in order to enforce collectivization. So how is it, a hundred years after the Bolshevik Revolution, that you still have people wearing Che Guevara t-shirts, saying that the idea of socialism wasn't so bad, it was messed up in the implementation, arguing even that it makes them morally superior? The idea that real socialism has never been tried is one of the more enduring myths in human discourse. But to see what's wrong with it, just try replacing the word socialist with the word fascist. Imagine somebody saying, well, we shouldn't judge fascism by the regimes in the 1930s that called themselves fascist. Real fascism, as a textbook theory, has never been tried. That would, of course, be a ridiculous position. We all see that fascism leads, in the end, to bloodshed, war and oppression. And so has every single communist regime. Afghanistan, Bulgaria, Cuba, they all rely on torture, on firing squads and on labor camps. 100 years on, it's time to recognize the evil for what it was. All right, welcome back. We're talking about government and how government is taking over uh, more and more of our liberty. As government expands, your liberty shrinks. 
Uh, we just heard a clip on socialism. Let me just uh, help you. I've traveled in uh, many communist countries. I was there in Russia right after the fall of communism. Uh, there's a story about Boris Yeltsin when he uh, left his country. When I, when I went to Moscow the first time and we went to buy groceries, we rented an apartment over there to set up a translating operation and hired a couple Russian computer people to uh, – produce literature for us so we went down to get groceries and we were all sleeping in this apartment together that we used as an office and we went down to the grocery store i'd never been to a russian grocery store and you stood in line and then you gave a list of what you wanted to a clerk and then they ran around the store and picked it up and there really wasn't anything on the shelves and uh they said oh we don't have that no we don't have that no no we don't have that so you just waited you you fronted the money and you gave them the list you fronted the money, and then they brought you a box of the stuff. So it said that in capitalism, the bread waits for you. Like I was in the grocery store yesterday, and there's a whole aisle with all different kinds of bread. There's pumpernickel bread. There's rye bread. There's sourdough bread. There's white bread. There's various white breads. There's uh, wheat breads, Russian rye bread, all kinds of breads, sliced bread, unsliced bread. They say in capitalism, the bread waits for you, crying out from the shelves, buy me, buy me, take me. And people fight to put their bread on the shelf because they want to sell their products. So they want some space on that shelf to peddle their new bread, like the seven seed whole wheat bread. But in socialism, whereas in capitalism, the bread waits for you, in socialism, you stand in line and wait for bread. That's the difference. And so what we have now is because we are hundreds of years since the founding fathers came up with this plan, we actually have a government that doesn't even look anything like what they planned, and it doesn't follow the Constitution, as you just heard Chris Ann Hall say later. They, many people think the federal government, with the federal government says it, by golly, we got to follow it. Chris Ann, so, Chris Ann Hall says, no, you don't have to follow any law if it violates the Constitution. Well, most of what's going on in our country violates the Constitution, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. So what we have in, in uh, right down to the local government, we have the same exact problems in local, local government as we had at state government, and we have at the federal government. We have morality problems. We have people getting fondled. Uh, sexual issues at the local level as well as the other levels. We have people mismanaging our money, people wanting to take away our rights, people wanting to not cut back, not shrink uh, the swamp, not drain the swamp. We don't have people in any party wanting to drain that swamp, neither at the local level. So all you hear at the local level is we need more money. We can't, we just can't survive without more money. So this article yesterday is that the uh mainly it's law enforcement but now they've thrown in fire it's short of money and they start talking about the fact that it, we've been short ever since the recession do you remember the recession that was created by the the uh housing crash where the the liberals starting back to clinton said everybody deserves a house even if they can't afford it so you, they forced the federal reserve system to uh loan people money that could not pay it. And so when they, when they began to, the payments started rolling in or the bills started rolling in, they couldn't pay it. Then people foreclosed on houses and all of a sudden we had a glut and it just backed up and banks were going bankrupt. And so we went into a recession. You remember that? And Yuba County was one of the fastest growing counties at that time, housing house building wise in the state. Do you remember that? Because the property is really cheap up here and the supervisors at that time, thought somehow they got thinking you know we all as human beings tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought according to the bible which you can count on not on government and so they thought that somehow there was something they were doing those five supervisors to create that great great boom in yuba county and so they thought my god we're so important and we are way underpaid and they doubled their pay and they went from about in the high 30s to 
over a, a couple raises when you count in all the benefits, health. And, and did you know that supervisors actually have retirement? So they got all these raises. And the other thing they did when they, when all this money was coming in for building fees, and there was a boom going on in Yuba County is they Robert Bendorf and the supervisors, Robert Bendorf is a county administrator said, we need, we, we feel so kindly towards all of our employees. We want to give them retroactive raises all the way back to the first day of employment. Some of them got raises, bumped their pay over a thousand dollars a month from what they, in other words, these people agreed to work for a certain amount of money and came to work for the county and worked for the county for many years and got raises here and there. But then we went and gave them, said, we, we love you so much, and we got all this money we don't know what to do with. We're going to give you retroactive raises, and those raises actually then will follow you right into CalPERS pensions and bump your pensions way up, spike your pensions. So they did all that, right? They gave themselves raises. They gave the entire county raises, and then the crash happened. They should have been reading the Bible because it said the Bible says you shouldn't presume upon the future and do stupid stuff like that. But then the crash happened. Did you think that they took any of that money back or those raises back? Do you think that the supervisors took responsibility for that crash, even though they took kind of responsibility for the boom? Nope, they didn't take any responsibility. In fact, I remember when Andy Vasquez, when he got elected or got appointed, he brought up the fact that he thought they ought to cut back their salaries and they they made fun of him and mocked him and uh john nicoletti and mary jane grego says we deserve every nickel we can get and uh if you don't pay people a ton of money you're not going to be able to get good quality candidates even though they joined at half the price so on we go into the recession, and then we've made a slow comeback. But another thing that happened in the 1990s in Yuba County was there was a sheriff named Gary Tyndall who decided we needed to expand the jail, remodel the jail. And instead of just remodeling it for Yuba County prisoners, he thought, hey, the federal government is looking for jails to rent space and we could actually bring money into the county by building a bigger jail and renting out space at say back then it was probably 40 or 50 dollars a bed per night uh, which obviously you provide room and board and medical now it's up to about 70 dollars a night i think and about five or six million dollars a year income so he came up with this idea of since we're going to construct this thing let's fill this whole block cortez square as they called it and so he made a cash cow or he made an income uh, generating operation and to house immigration uh, deportees or people that were fighting immigration issues and had been had committed crimes and then they had an immigration hold on. They put them in our jail, one of many places in the United States. So it was, but what happened then instead of the the sheriff continuing to be funded out of the out of the funds of the taxes of the taxpayers and then this other money this immigration money being used to cover the housing of the immigration officials and then any profits being set aside for special operations or something more and more of the sheriff's budget it is this is what government does it baits and switches so it can move funds around so it began to take funds away from taxpayer funds away from the sheriff's department and replace those and told them to live on the immigration funds in other words the immigration money was covering the immigration holds the people in that were being held by the immigration authorities plus use the profits to fund your sheriff operation so they kept taking money out of the sheriff's pocket out of the general fund and spending it on other things what were other things more employees more salaries higher salaries more employees do you see any big improvements around the county nope so um so that's exactly what happened and so uh sheriff durfer has uh euphemistically referred to the immigration money as ice crack that's immigration and customs enforcement it's called ice crack in other words uh it feels good while you got it but if you ever got to get off it you're going to have a really tough time it's a false sense of euphoria 
And so they've been living with ice crack and living under the immigration funding. But now that isn't even sufficient because why? Because they keep raising the costs. Where are these extra costs coming from? Well, uh, they say, most counties will say, well, if we don't raise, it, it's like every county says it about every other county. There's 58 counties in California. So they say, if we don't raise it, then they're going to go to X county. If we don't raise it, they're going to go to Y county. If we don't raise it, they're going to go A and B counties. The other thing that, that has been a killer is two things, CalPERS, the retirement fund, and the health funds, the cost of health insurance. They can't afford it. The benefits and the raises have continually been authorized by the supervisors. That's who authorizes the, the, the changes in the, the salary structure. The supervisors approve that. And then they go to the unions who they negotiate with when it's time to get reelected because they're making $80,000 a year plus a retirement. And they say, Hey, we got your back when at last, you know, we, uh, we love you. We supported you during your raises, support me to get reelected. And so they do. And then when it's time for raises again, they go to the supervisor and say, you remember all that money? And those, we walked the streets for you. And then they raise the set. Then they raise, uh, they raise votes and money for the supervisor. They, they just go back and forth and back and forth. It's incestuous, right? It's like you can't find a, a partner in life, so you have sex with your niece. It's convenient, close to home, easy. So that's what we have now is, is we have, uh, let me give you a sense of some of these salaries. Robert Bendorf, these are 2016 uh, salaries. These are lower than they are now. We have uh, 16, we have 11 people in the county that are getting paid over $200,000 a year. Now, these people, the when you think of Yuba County, uh, let's see here. The per capita income in Yuba County is $21,418. That's if you take all the income in the county and divide it by all the people in the county. That's $21,418. If you look at median household income, that's counting all the income in the households. And the median is halfway between the lowest and the highest, right? It's 48,739. So a household, a median, the middle of the, most of the households right in the middle are making around say 45 to 50, 55,000 dollars, right? Hold that thought as I tell you these salaries. There's a 70 about 75,000 people in Yuba County. Now, in order to manage the government uh let's see, the government we have 1,013 employees working for Yuba County. 689 are year round. And we got some part timers, right? In order to manage them, and and this is the level of government that we have grown into. We have Robert Bendorf at County Administrator, two hundred and seventy seven thousand. Sheriff Durfer, two hundred and sixty seven thousand. I'm not even gonna add that final hundreds of dollars. Patrick McGrath, District Attorney, two hundred sixty-four thousand. Nicole Quick, Health Officer, two hundred sixty-one thousand. Kevin Mallon, Community Development Service Agency Director, two hundred thirty-nine thousand. Uh, the County Council, she's gone, but they got a new one. She was at two hundred thirty, almost two hundred forty thousand. Jennifer Vasquez, Head of Health and Human Services, Welfare, basically, two hundred twenty-seven thousand. Uh, there's a bunch of them in the 200 thousands. Now I am all for law enforcement and fire because it's constitutional and it's biblical. We need it, right? It's public service. You got it. All the other stuff, health, welfare, ain't even in the, it isn't even in the constitution. That's just extra foo for all. Now, this is, this is a shocker. I'm going to give you some numbers on people that are just managing people that ain't working. Health and welfare, welfare, health and human service. They don't like to use that term welfare because it has a baggage with it. 
Jennifer Vasquez, who is director of health and human services is 227,000 and change. Tina Taylor, director of child support, 206,000 and change. Kathleen Cole, deputy director of health and human services, 190,000 and change. Uh, Pamela Morash, deputy director of health and human service, 185,000 and change. We even got a chief information officer. Let's see, we got 75,000 people in Yuba County. We have to have an information officer to inform us of stuff, right? $185,000 for that. Got it? Uh, let's see who else we got here that I could tell you about. How about this person? Carol Newsom, health and human program manager. Just keeping track of all the programs, 154,000 and change. Now, when you add up these health and human services, just people that are over welfare, this is stuff the churches and nonprofits used to do before government took over charity. This is forced charity. This is taking your money. Andy Vasquez was talking in his show earlier with a couple supervisors. We had three supervisors in here. He's talking about people stealing from each other. This is legalized theft. We have government passing laws. You didn't get to vote on it. And they pass laws to uh, create more government. Then to fund that, they raise the taxes that you didn't have anything to do with. They take your taxes and then they give it out to people that are making in a, in a, one of the poorest, if not the poorest county of 58 in California, people are making approaching 300,000 a year. Now, when you add up these five women, uh, that are working, running health and human services, it's over a million dollars a year, almost, almost 1.1 million a year. These people are wanting more of your money. Now, they say it's for it's for uh, law enforcement. Now, let me just tell you, in recent history, some of you are already forgetting this. The city of Marysville, after making a very bad investment decision, which they shouldn't even be involved in making investments, the city of Marysville, no one has any skill down there with that. They shouldn't be risking taxpayers' money for anything. They risked it. They, they got us into a $17 million bond pay payback on five, point five acres right across from Ellis Lake. It's just barren ground that they're hoping that somebody will come in and buy from them. They bought that right before the recession. They've re rebonded it. They bonded it twice. They bonded it, and then they rebonded it because they still couldn't make the payments. They can't make the payments on it. So instead of, like, saying, we screwed up, and now we need to have a tax increase to pay back this bond, what they said was, we're not going to be able to provide you police and fire. They lied, just flat-out lied, and they got an, a big developer by the name of Roy and David Lonza to fund that, the development because the city council is forbidden – by law to campaign and pay taxpayer dollars to uh, against the people on a tax increase. So they went out and they got a developer to fund that. And then they turned around and gave him a marijuana dispensary. Now, how about that? So what we have is the, the first time they went out for a, an election on that, the voters turned it down. The second time they went out with the Lonza money and sent out a lot of slick flyers convinced enough people to raise taxes by 1%. Because of the way they uh, designed that measure or proposition, however you want to say it, they were not mandated by law to use that for any particular reason, the money, $1.5 a year coming in for 10 years. That, and so uh, they said, hey, trust us. You can trust us. We love you guys. We're, we're your city council people. Trust us. And we're going to actually get a citizens committee to oversee us and give you confidence in us so they'll make sure that all this money that we're bringing in goes to police and fire. You heard anything about that committee? Do you think that money went towards police and fire? You know what the first thing they did was when they started collecting that money? They raised the salaries 
of employees in the city, including the administrator, the county manager, Walter Munchheimer, as if he, you know, in government, you do not have to perform well to get a raise. Did you know that? I never got a raise in my life that I didn't, it wasn't based on performance. Just because I breathed and they, then I had normal blood pressure, they did not give me a raise. But in government, if you breathe and your war butt is warming the seat, you get a raise. And so Walter Munchheimer got a raise, and just a few months later, when the city man, the city council uh, disagreed with him on an issue, he quit, and he took his spike and pay to increase his retirement, and he's moving. Isn't that great? So when they promised, oh, we're going to use all this money for police and fire, they didn't. And you know what happened next? Not only did the money uh, not be dedicated to police and fire, they turned around and they bonded another about a million dollars. In other words, bond out there in Lyndon Oliver. So that means you go to your buddy and get and somebody fronts you some money so you can go buy some dope. So they got some money fronted to them and they bought 19 brand new police cars. Now, did they need police cars? Yeah, they probably needed some new police cars. Did they need 19? No, they didn't need 19 all of it, but they just got a deal they couldn't refuse. I don't know how many out there uh, believe in borrowing money, but I'll tell you, you can't find anywhere in the world that endorses that in money management, whether it's biblical or not, going out and borrowing money, borrowing money, borrowing money. As they say in the Bible, the borrower is servant to the lender. In this case, the borrower is the taxpayers of Marysville. We're servant to the lender. In other words, our money, instead of going to improve parks, to improve the curbs, gutters, sewage, trees, plant trees, improve things, it's just going to interest. Millions of dollars in interest each year. And we were told that this extra 1% tax was going to secure us police and fire. Well, it didn't because we had to go back out and borrow more money right after we give them 1%. And there's no guarantee do you think if we change three city council people at the next election, any of those people are going to be cognizant? That means remembering or familiar with or care about the commitment they made. You think politicians making a verbal commitment that is not in law? There's nothing in law. There's nothing on the books. There's nothing mandated that you can take them to court and say you misappropriated funds. They can spend that money on Dr. Pepper, cases of Dr. Pepper. They can do whatever they want with that money. Build a new city hall, do whatever they want, that extra tax. Now we have Yuba County saying we're all going to meet to we're all going to meet here this uh, this coming Tuesday. We want you to come on over at 1 they're going to start at 9 in the morning, but at 1:30 they're going to discuss ways to raise money. This has nothing to do with you. All it is is a big old hoopty doopty. And uh, the fact is they're going to put on the ballot, eventually put on the ballot to raise taxes, and it'll only take 50% of you plus one of you, 50% plus one to get that passed. And there's going to be no guarantees. Okay, we're going to come... That's the bad sign right there that I've spoke too long. We'll be right back for two more hours. Jerusalem is still the capital of Israel and must remain an undivided city accessible to all. As soon as I take office, I will begin the process of moving the United States ambassador to the city of Israel as chosen as its capital. I continue to say that uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel, and I have said that before and I will say it again. And Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel and it must remain undivided. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. 
While previous presidents have made this a major campaign promise, they failed to deliver. Today, I am delivering. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. This is a long overdue step to advance the peace process and to work towards a lasting agreement. All right. Well, we got no live stream because somebody stole the box, but we got the water turned on. So Santos broke away while he's running the board and went out there and did some plumbing. So I have a clip that I want to play that just is so symbolic of the waste in government and the mismanagement of government, it's, it's Trey Gowdy, who's the congressman from South Carolina, uh, questioning people from the government services agency or general services agency for the government. Here. Our fellow citizens' frustration with government, they are absolutely convinced that we spend their money differently from the way that we would spend our own, and they are exactly correct. The rest of America cannot comprehend of a $44 breakfast. They are pouring generic brand cereal while you are eating a $44 breakfast. The rest of America would never conceive of a $7 Monte Cristo mini sandwich. And neither would you if you were spending your own money. You don't go out of your pocket and buy commemorative coins. I don't know anyone who does that. But we don't hesitate to spend taxpayer money on a trinket like that. Giving bicycles to indigent children is a wonderful idea. I hate that you robbed yourself of the satisfaction of knowing what it feels like to do it yourself instead of spending someone else's money to do it. The ostensible purpose of this hearing was to exchange ideas. You know, Alexander Graham Bell has this marvelous invention called a telephone. Or better yet, video conferencing. The notion that you have to spend $800,000 to exchange ideas is laughable and perhaps criminal. And the part that galls me the most is the hypocrisy of GSA not even following its own damn rules. You are so quick to make everyone else follow the rules, and you can't follow your own rules. You have an event planner on staff. That'll come as quite a surprise to most taxpayers. What will come as even more of a surprise is the fact that you didn't even use them. You paid somebody else to plan the event despite the fact that you have event planners at taxpayer salary. And the scouting trips. You know, Mr. Chairman, the tribes of Israel sent 12 scouts into the Promised Land before they decided to invade, and GSA has to spend send 15 to Las Vegas to check out a hotel. Do you not see the outrage in that, Mr. Robertson? Do you see it? Absolutely. This conference was outrageous. Well, I'm not going to be as self-congratulatory as some other people are. I think the fact that we're having a hearing is a loss. Most people don't need a hearing to know that you don't spend other people's money the way that money was spent at this conference. We don't need a list of recommendations from the Inspector General. We don't need to be reminded that you can't negotiate a discount on a purse because the, the, the U.S. government decided to contract with a hotel. That is criminal. And a mind reader? My guess is they will not need a mind reader to find out the American public 
has lost confidence in the institutions of government. And the response, I want indictments, Mr. Inspector General. That's a great way to get people's attention, an indictment. Not a memo, not corrective measure, an indictment. I went through your report and I wrote 25 times, what's the penalty? What's the penalty for doing what you found that they did? What is the penalty for negotiating a discount on a purse for your personal use because you work for the government and you steered work? What's the, purpose, what's the penalty for tipping off a competitor of another bid? That sounds remarkably criminal to me, Mr. Inspector General. All right. The reason I played that is that that goes on in our own community. I'll give you an example. The Yuba County supervisors are going to be asking you for more money. Robert Bendorf and his wife both work for the county. They make together about $430,000 dollars a year if you can do the math that's about 30 some thousand dollars a month and what uh what trey Grouty was telling the general services people is they went out and got some bicycles for indigent kids they said why don't you use their own money to do that did you feel good about taking someone else's money be like me taking my neighbor's money and going out and giving it to the poor. But that's exactly what we did in taking our taxpayer money and building a camp and starting to fund people that are homeless, quote unquote, vagrants, derelicts, whatever happened to them. Everybody's got something happened to them. Even people are living in houses are having tough times at different times, getting cancer, having kids die. We just with a, family at the hospital whose 12, 11 month old boy died. So they had a house. So everything ain't as bad as just not having a house. But the supervisors felt good that each supervisor is making $80,000 a year over there in, in Yuba County. Plus we, everybody's doing really good over there. A hundred, 270,000, dollars for Robert Bendorf and wife, Melanie working for the DA's office, making another hundred and, uh, 52,000. Honestly, uh, they could fund that whole homeless thing themselves and still have plenty to live on. But instead, it's somehow the taxpayer's responsibility, but we didn't have any say in it. And now we're out of money. Just because of my, uh, many people know that I, I, I'm not employed by the Territorial Dispatch, uh, I used to write some articles for the Appeal Democrat, I mean, letters to the editor, and then I finally quit because they always wanted to change them. And I thought, well, I used to tell them, if they want to change my letter, why don't you just sign it yourself? So I just finally quit fussing with them. They didn't want to do their own research. They wanted me to do the research for them. So anyway, I wrote, I started writing an article here and then for the Territorial, but because of my involvement with the Territorial, I know this to be true. Most of you know what a legal notice is. Sometimes when you start a business, you get a business license, you have to file a legal notice, or maybe you get a divorce, you do an adoption, or you do this or that, or change your name. You got to do a legal notice. It's a legal document. You have to pay to put it in the paper, and papers screw people because they know they have to put that in the paper. So the appeal Democrat who had a monopoly on legal notices for years, screwed people with the rates. Go check them out for yourself. They had a monopoly on Yuba and Sutter counties, and a few years ago, the territorial, because of its expanding circulation and been in business for years and years and years, got also adjudicated. So then you had a choice, just like you could go buy a Chevy or a Ford or a Toyota or a Nissan, and you could compare. So now you could compare column inches and you are fulfilling the same legal rules, legal requirements, but you could buy your, your inches, run your ad in a different paper at maybe <clears throat> anywhere from 25 to nearly 40% difference, cheaper. 
in the appeal. So when the owner of the territorial went to the different department heads in Yuba County, because counties and cities have to run their own ads, he went to both the city and the county, and they just said, we're not going to run ads with you. They, they said, well, first of all, you don't have the circulation or you, the timing will be wrong. All of that was baloney. In fact, Dan Mirzwa, the uh, treasurer of the, the county of Yuba, recently said, the reason I don't run my ads with the territorial is you don't have the circulation that the appeal does. But he didn't realize that the appeal Democrat doesn't even serve the hill country of Yuba County any longer. And the territorial is the only one. He didn't know what he was talking about. And, it, and so the taxpayers, these are the same people that want you to raise your taxes because they have run out of money in the county of Yuba. And yet they're paying 25 to 38 percent, I think, in, more than they have to on all the ads they run in the paper whenever there's, they're having to declare anything legally. So you think, oh. You mean they're not they're not looking out for our best interests? I just had uh, I had a lunch with a Caltrans worker here recently, and he was commenting about my comments about all the Caltrans workers walking around the streets of Marysville drinking lattes during the day with their ID tags around their neck. And he was commenting to me that in in Caltrans, uh, although he said, "Please don't use my name." He said, Lou, we spend way more than we have to for any of the products that we use. And you can just imagine all the products they use, right? You see people going up and down the street. They're painting. They're building. They're, they're uh, using coatings. They're using signs, metals, all kinds of stuff, right? He said, we pay way more than we need to because salespeople and lobbyists go to the uh, legislators and then they tell the heads of Caltrans or they go to head of Caltrans and they say you got to use these guys and it isn't the cheapest price same thing goes on between the territorial dispatch and the appeal Democrat the appeal Democrat kisses the ass of the county and so they give them the money that's how that works it's called crony capitalism and then the same people that are doing that and getting paid $277,000 a year to supposedly run a really efficient and honest county, you're getting ripped off left and right. How, if they're doing that on newspaper ads, what else are they doing that on? In the mid-90s, the supervisors wanted to have a a tax on hotels called a transit occupancy tax and the reason for that i want you to listen to the reasons because the reasons never hold up oh we need to raise one percent in the city of marisol to keep our police department they'll take care of our police and fire and then they use the money to give all the employees raises so they wanted this transit occupancy tax a tot they called it a TOT, and they asked uh, Hal Stalker, who was the uh, supervisor in the 5th District, and they asked a, a longtime opponent, John Missler. He was also a supervisor in that same district. They, they asked them to do an ad together to, to convince you to pass this tax. I remember voting against it myself, but it passed because you were convinced that this was going to benefit tourism. This tax, we were told, was going to go into a fund to attract tourism to Yuba County, and that would help businesses, et cetera, et cetera, advertise the lakes, the rivers, the fishing, the hunting, the skiing, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know where that tax went? That transit occupancy tax. It went in the general fund. It just got lost in the general fund and went out to buy goodies and raises and just general spent. 
add more employees. Now, you know something? I know a lot of people work for the county. In fact, some of them help me at the jail. I have health officials coming in the jail, and they teach on STDs, and that's sexually transmitted diseases out there in all of us. You need to watch that, guys. And also, uh, they teach on tobacco and nutrition and health, and they do, you know, I, and they're all nice people. But honestly, people, when are we going to just, why, why do we feel like we need to run a health department? or welfare department or public works. Some of it maybe we need like public works, but why don't we just subcontract that out? I was having a talk in the lobby before we started today with Randy Fletcher. And I said, Randy, nobody's wanting to change anything. They don't want to change at the federal level. It doesn't matter what initials after the name, whether it's a D or an R, they don't want to change Jack because they have an interest and an investment in keeping things the way they are, even if they're screwed up. Why do we need multiple administrators over health and human services? Is it that big of an operation? Maybe we should get some of these people off welfare. Maybe we should just tell the state we don't want to run, want to run, want to run a welfare operation. Oh, I, I, I left this gal out. She's a deputy. We all these directors, and then we have a deputy director. Here's deputy director of child support services, $145,000. We, we created welfare. The government said we, we can do better with welfare than the nonprofits can. We know, how to, we know how to hand out money. So these people are professional givers. They don't hold anybody accountable, but they give it away, and, man, it's I, who who would have believed when you went to college but get into social services you can make a hundred you could get rich working for these welfare why don't we just cut some of these outfits out why don't we cut some of these administrators out why don't we cut why don't we just eliminate the health department and have that done by right out hospital or one of these clinics and offer health services uh the Constitution said we need to have law enforcement, which would include the justice system to prosecute people that are doing stupid stuff, but the rest of it is foo for all, optional. But you think they're going to make it? No, they're going to. What they're going to do is make you feel like you were included, and then they're going to ask for one percent. And do you think there's going to be any guarantee that that's going to go to the sheriff's department? In fact, the last paragraph. Uh, is interesting. Jake Abbott wrote this for the Appeal Democrat, and let me just read. I'm going to read it. If voters were to approve a 1% tax increase for the unincorporated areas of the county, consultants estimate, you know, it's interesting. You pay, you pay an administrator $277,000. He can't figure it out himself. He got to hire a consultant. Consultants estimate the increase would generate an additional $4.3 million in its first full year of implementation. Implementation, Okay, fine. Listen to this. Bendorf said that the additional revenue would help the county rebound from the recession. It didn't say help fund the law enforcement and fire. He just said it would help the county rebound from the recession and potentially enhance the amount of services potentially enhance the amount of services and programs that are provided to local residents. There's no guarantee here at all that it would solve the law enforcement's problem of being down 20 or 30 positions in their department from what they were uh, when it was high living in the late 2000s, in, in 2006, 7, or the early 2000s, 2006, 7, 8, when they had like 50 people on patrol. Uh, in the patrol ranks, and they had more dispatchers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people, when are we going to, you know, how many bonds are we going to pass for water conservation or water resources, and they use the, the money for bike trails? How many times are you going to vote for that? Well, this is what's going to happen. I don't want to spend any more time on it. We're, we're, uh, I got more things to talk about, but I just wanted to give you a shot. You can read the article in the paper online or uh, in the appeal democrat yesterday and uh but 
the fact is the county uh we're making we get the poorest county of of the 58 counties and we're making people rich can you imagine two people getting married and weren't in little old Yuba County, it's just 70,000 people. You think just a couple people can manage the needs? We're not talking about managing the lives of 70-some 70, 70 thousand people. We're just simply overseeing county government. The thing is, if we got county government smaller, we wouldn't have to pay people so much or so many people to manage. We got directors. We got deputy directors. We got deputy, deputy, deputy directors. We got deputy, deputy, deputy directors. Those people ain't helping any homeless people. They don't even know. You know, do you know something that for 277,000 people, you know, when we got down to working with the homeless, we had to hire in a consultant named Scott Thurmond. And you know what he said? No guarantees in any of my, any of my ideas will even work. Did you know that? If I had a consultant, tell me that. At two hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars, you'd think you could figure out the sales tax and the and the homeless problem. I got people that never went to college that got the homeless thing dialed in. Man, all right. I think I got that covered. All right, let's see. I want to move down here, and I I want to address this. Uh, sexual perversion in our government it's actually in society right and then we vote people into office and they take their problems right in there with them did you know that some people say you know i worked for a church for years and we every once in a while we'll have somebody do something wrong sexually right now they how what, what don't you check people uh, well they don't have a record we you know we were the first church in the entire community to fingerprint and background check people because of my connection with law enforcement. So we did that 20 years ago. And, uh, but you know, if somebody doesn't have a record and you don't know what's lurking in their heart, right? So then they do something stupid and you got to address it. Well, then you, then you do something like that. Then people say, Oh, that glad tiny church, you know, it's like on Wednesday night, they teach people how to molest girls, right? Hold that thought. You know, some people just need to go to Yuba College and take a critical thinking course on how to put two and two together. But uh, so we end up with these people in power, whether they be a supervisor, city councilman, assemblyman, state senator, United States senator, and then they do something stupid. They think because they're a big shot, like I'm a supervisor, so I get to grab your butt or massage your boobs and uh, or play around at work with you and so uh do you think were you stupid enough to think that these hollywood people didn't know that weinstein was a rapist or that all these other people were molested women or did you were you too stupid to think that nancy pelosi didn't know these people that were democrat legislators weren't molesting people in fact they're now the guy the molesters themselves were saying nancy came and and campaigned for me and she knew that i was dirty that's something and then all the time they're making a big deal about trump and all these people did you notice that these people all knew all of them were ripping off people molesting people that in fact L L lena if Linda Dunham, is that her name? Linda Dunham. She told the Clinton campaign in the midst of the fight for the presidency that Weinstein was a rapist. She just told him that. It didn't make any difference to him. Why? Because they were making a lot of money off that dude. This whole thing is sick, corrupt. It stinks all the way through. It's rotten, right? You ever opened a piece of fruit and it looked good on the outside and you open it up and you think that apple is just rotten to the core. That's exactly what our society is all the way through. We'll be right back. We got to, uh, right? We got to take a break. He says we got to take a break. We got a half a show left. We, I think we have enough to talk about. So we'll, we'll try to keep you busy. Be right.
This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. The Justice Department has asked to review documents from the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on Planned Parenthood. This potentially implicates them in the sale of aborted babies' body parts for profit. Planned Parenthood is terrified of having their sordid business model exposed and claimed three congressional committees investigated them and found no wrongdoing. In reality, all three investigations simply ended when the select investigative panel on infant lives was formed and took over. The panel issued a nearly 500-page report detailing evidence Planned Parenthood may have trafficked in organs of aborted babies. Based on the evidence, the panel made 13 criminal referrals. Please join me in praying that truth prevails and justice is done. Follow us on Twitter at Life Issues USA and stay informed, more informed than you've ever Let's break from the daily pervy man update to offer my final thoughts on something we should all care about, American jobs. And actually just closing that book on pervy men, it was Democrat Bill Clinton who reminded us back in the 90s of two very important lessons. One, the best anti-poverty measure is still a job. And two, Welfare is meant to be a second chance, not a way of life. Yeah, it's true. The Democratic Party used to be somewhat reasonable. Boy, what a difference from the modern-day Democratic position of free stuff for everyone. Well, sorry, our country doesn't operate like that. Maybe under crazy Bernie Sanders, but not with Donald J. Trump. Well, this week, the president hit the nail on the head once again when he pointed out our nation's desperate need for welfare reform, and he's right. It's ridiculous some Americans have to work their butts off to make a living while others sit back and suck off the system. It's wrong and fundamentally un-American. So why does it happen? Well, look no further than your favorite Democrats. See, here's the play. Democrats want to give poor Americans just enough of a handout to keep them coming back to the voting booth because government dependence is a surefire way to maintain power. But here's the thing about entitlement recipients. Some of these people, they don't want to work. Work means making enough to lose the welfare goodies. That's how sick and wrong our system is. Work your butt off and struggle, but sit back, do nothing, have more kids, and watch the handouts grow. That's not the American dream. The American dream isn't rob hardworking Peter to pay lazy Paul. Maybe that's what separates conservatives from Democrats. See, conservatives, we want you to get a hand up, not a hand out. We want you to reach your potential and provide for yourself because, damn it, it feels good to be a productive member of society. The Democrats don't think you can do it. They pat you on the back and say, poor you, you're a victim, you're entitled to what others earn. That's not compassion, it's condescending and it's BS. The government can give you a lot, but it can't give you self-worth. The welfare system is meant to be a safety net, not a hammock for the system suckers. Entitlements are supposed to be for the sickest, weakest, and most vulnerable among us. If we keep letting the welfare abusers suck us dry, we won't have any resources left for those who truly need it. So, let's heed the advice of President Trump and, yes, President Bill Clinton. Make America work again. Your Obama phones just turned into alarm clocks, so get up and get to work. Those are my final thoughts. From L.A., God bless and take care. You ever hear somebody tell you an amazing story about how they almost got killed? I know it sounds like it's a skirt in Ireland, but that's how black people say it. <laughs> killed, you know, man, if I would've turned this way, man, I would've got killed. But something told me to go the other way. I didn't want to be a Christian either for a long time, because some Christians are creepy. There's some creepy Christians. It's creepy everything. It's creepy Muslims, but some Christians is creepy. You ever had somebody, they talk about God and they voice change all of a sudden? Like, yo, man, how you doing? I'm cool. Can I tell you about the Lord? What is wrong with your voice? <laughs> What's wrong with your voice? Or somebody start praying in the middle of your conversation? You was just having a conversation. Yo, you see the game? That was a good game. Man, that game was a good guy. We just thank you for being so holy, Lord. You're so awesome. I'm like, are we praying right now? You are creepy. Before I became a Christian, I, used to, I would ask a girl out, and this, this one girl, I remember, she said to me, she said, I'm dating Jesus. I didn't know what that meant. Now I realize she was just saying she wanted to get closer to God before she started dating. Back then, I had no idea. I thought she was dating Jesus. 
a month later, she called me up and said, you still want to go out? I'm like, did you break up with Jesus? I'm like, I don't know for sure, but I think it was your fault, whatever happened. It was your, now you come to me, you are confused. You better go back, I'm telling you. He forgives you for everything and you get free wine? You better call him. You better go call him. Because what if I'm the jealous type, right? I walk in the room, she praying, I'm like, who you talking to? Because you got different types of Christians. This is what I found out. You got Christians who are cool. You can hang around with them. Iron sharpen iron relationships. Right? Then you got Christians who may have a little limp in their walk. They got the hat on, but the shoes don't match. <laughs> then you got Christians who, I'm just going to put this out there. You ever know somebody that was oversaved? <laughs> don't look at them. Don't look at them. <laughs> You can't even have a regular conversation with him. He's like, hey, man, I'm thirsty. You thirsty? Thirsty for the Lord. <laughs> thirsty for the Lord? Hey, I lost my keys. Could you help me find my keys? You need the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> my God, I didn't drive a kingdom. <laughs> I drove a Toyota. <laughs> I know as soon as I said oversave, some of y'all had somebody in mind, but if you didn't, somebody had you in mind. You can be oversaved. You ain't know it. Now I got to let you know that you're oversaved. A couple indicators to let you know you're oversaved. Just a couple indicators. Um, if you don't mess around with computers because it got a cursor. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you rebuke vacuum cleaners because it's a dirt devil. I got an aunt that's oversaved. She messes up television shows for us. We're watching Extreme Makeover Home Edition. The beginning of the show, they always tell you the sad story about the people. My aunt gonna start praying for them. Lord, help them get a new house, Lord. Just... They're gonna get a new house. They're gonna get a new house. She's like, yes, you gotta believe. I'm like... Now you got to have cable is what you got to do. All right. Well, you can see why they want to scrub any uh, connection to biblical living out of our government because it just gets embarrassing when you're out there screwing all the uh, people in the office, men doing it with men, men doing it with women, and uh, molesting people. And uh, did you hear that the Congress said, well, maybe we, Congress people said, maybe we ne need to have some in-service training on how to behave around each other. I thought, you know something? We're throwing little children, five-year-old children out of school for smooching a little boy, smooching a girl and hugging a girl. We got more penalties for that than we got dealing with adult people that have been through all kinds of stuff in their life, been attorneys, been through law school, all that stuff, been in business, had all kinds of educating. And now we're going to try to say you're not supposed to touch people and mess with people and assault people. Every day now there are people uh, falling out of the fallen out over this whole situation. Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi are just confused with what to do with all these things. Listen to all these people. Al Franken, John Conyers, Trent Franks, Blake Farenthold. Blake Farenthold uh, is a Republican, Texas who used $84,000 in taxpayer money to settle a staffer's harassment claim. Joe Barton, another Republican out of Texas, was sexting a constituent on Facebook and had a nude selfie of himself, got leaked. I don't know, that dude's old. I don't know whether he would be that attractive unless he was, like, Photoshopping himself. 
Ruben Kehun, a freshman Nevada Democrat, accused of proposition of former campaign aide. It just goes on and on and on. Um, Kathleen Rice, she's a Democrat in New York. She's a former prosecutor who's been among the most vocal Democrats urging accused lawmakers to resign. Thank you, Kathleen Rice. Said much of the reason Congress's approval rating is at a historic low is because the public perceives elected officials to be applying different, more lenient standards to themselves. It's, it's way worse than that, Kathleen. It's like laws pertain to us little people, but they don't apply to everybody else. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Re Representative Republican Ron DeSantis from Florida has offered legislation requiring lawmakers who settle harassment claims to be named publicly. Did you know that wasn't possible before? These Congress people could molest somebody and pay them off with your money and my money and stay confidential. I get sick of this confidential. Oh, I have a question for somebody in the school system. Well, that's confidential. You have a question, somebody in the government. Well, that's confidential. We're just, you're just not important enough to find out anything about anything. DeSantis also would also like to insist upon whoever they've spent money on behalf of would have to pay back the treasury. If the treasury, if the government gets sued, that the individual who did the bad deed would have to pay back the treasury. Do you wonder why we're even having to talk about that? Doesn't that seem like it's just fair that if I was a legislator and I did something wrong and the government paid for me? Like, I'll give you an example. Let's give a local example. Carl Adams, district attorney of, and once president of, I believe, the attorney District Attorneys Association in California, he led debate teams at Yuba City High School. He was an elder in his church at the Methodist Church. I think for 32 years or something like that, <clears throat> he served Sutter County. And uh, so finally, he is accused of possibly burning down the house of a prostitute he had sex with after giving her immunity in a murder case where one of her clients was murdered. And with her testimony, she got another client sent to prison. So after that all happened, and according to the prostitute, Carl Adams had sex with her. When he was interviewed by Jason Parker, who's now been kicked to the curb by the Sutter County DA for reasons we're not quite sure of yet because it's not our business, when he was interviewed, when Jason Parker was a detective for Yuba City Police Department, Carl Adams, the district attorney of Sutter County, lied about his sexual interaction with the prostitute. When confronted with the fact that the prostitute didn't lie about it, then he kind of was caught. But then he lied to the Appeal Democrats saying, I think Jason Parker just got his facts all screwed around. Now, I was talking before I just gave that introduction about Carl Adams about people doing wrong things and then the county taxpayer having to pick up the tab for it. What had happened is Carl Adams was misappropriating funds, taking funds that should have been for certain things and using them for something else. Like victim witness funds were going to help the DA's office budget. And then drug abuse funds coming from the state were going to prosecute Robert Stark, for political purposes, he was the auditor controller at that time, and they were trying to run him out of office, Carl Adams. So when a, a lady working in the victim's witness office confronted Jana McClung, who was the assistant to Carl Adams, that they were misusing victim witness funds, she said, oh, I'll take care of it, did nothing about it. So the employee for victim witness contacted the state of California who provides the victim witness funds. They came in, 
And and in the meantime, Carl Adams realized she contacted the uh, state, and he fired her. She filed a suit against the county for sexual harassment because they were verbally harassing her and making sexual comments to her. And they paid her off with $150,000 of taxpayer funds. Carl Adams should have been in this new, uh, if this ever becomes law all the way down to the county level, Carl Adams then would be responsible to pay the county back that $150,000 because it was his fault that the county got sued. You see what I'm getting at? Now, this is how bad the city, the county of Sutter has been corrupt. They're not the only county, but it's the one I, I've been involved in. You've been Sutter County. That's where I've been living for most of my whole life. This Sutter County was so saturated with sexual improprieties. One day, one, a lady went to Carl, said she was going to be leaving his employment, and he said, why don't you leave me a pair of your panties on my desk? I want you to think about that statement. I, I, I've been, uh, I must say that I'm no prude, but I'd have never asked a lady for a pair of her panties to be put on my desk. Now, I don't know whether they teach that down there in law school. I'm not quite sure where, where you get that, where you are talking to somebody other than your spouse and you ask them for some of their undergarments. Or you send, from what I'm told by people inside that office, sleazy sexual emails around. That seemed to be okay in Sutter County. And it may be okay with some because they got some glee out of it and they were having group sex in that office. But they were also people that were afraid because they had kids at home that they were supporting and putting through school and they had house payments and they knew that if they stood up for what, what really was right, that a bunch of wrong would be done to them and that they would get fired. And there's a lot of evidence that that would happen because whistleblowers tend to get fired and lose their job, just like Elizabeth Pollard lost her job because she said that taxpayer money was being misused by Carl Adams. She lost her job. She won the lawsuit, but she lost her job. And many times you lose your reputation because people don't want to take a chance on hiring you. So, oh, so in the county of Sutter, do you think that the supervisors did a thing about it? I've had many discussions with county supervisors on why they didn't do anything about it. I have some ideas. They have some excuses. I have some ideas. They wanted the power. They didn't want to mess with Carl Adams because he had political power. They wanted his votes. You wonder, Assemblyman James Gallagher was on the board when this all happened. Didn't say a thing about it. You just wonder how many people had things to protect in this whole situation. It's been rumored for years and it's become uh, pretty obvious to many people that there's been accusations against Jim Whitaker, the supervisor for Sutter County. Jim's dad, Roy Whitaker, was sheriff for many years, I think 17 years before he was defeated by a lieutenant with the Yuba City Police Department, then Art Brandwood. Sheriff Whitaker, Roy Whitaker, brought and endorsed and got Carl Adams elected in the beginning, and Carl Adams was indebted to Roy Whitaker. And so if anything ever happened with anything to do with Roy Whitaker, including Jim Whitaker, his son, Carl Adams would not prosecute him. So there was a situation where uh, a girl at Yuba City High School accused Jim Whitaker and went to the principal, Bill Highland, and accused Jim Whitaker of grabbing her, groping her. Same thing that's happening at the, at the federal level at, with people like 
uh, Franken and others feeling they, they have a right to do that. And so Bill Hyland uh, did not do anything about it. He's a mandated reporter. But, you know, when you're, when you're in position of authority, you can ignore the law. Did you know that? It happens all the time. Just make up rules for yourself. And so as a teacher at the high school, uh, this girl accused him, Whitaker, of groping her. And Highland, according to the parents, uh, discouraged them, said, oh, you know, we don't want to do anything about it. It's going to be hard on your girl here on the campus. What would you do if you were a parent? So they went to the district attorney, Carl Adams who was beholden to the sheriff at that time, Roy Whitaker. And uh, so he said, oh, well, we don't want to do anything about this. It's going to, you know, probably wouldn't work out for you anyway. And basically shut the family down. Other, other people have brought accusations also at the school. How many times do you think that's going to happen before people aren't willing to come forward? You wonder why Franken went on for years and then finally one person came forward and then two people came forward and then three people and four people. I think we're up to seven on Franken. And he's actually not denied any of it. He kind of hit in his... Uh, what I thought was going to be his resignation apology speech, he, ne he did neither. He kind of blamed Trump. He blamed uh, other people that are being accused and kind of said, well, it may have happened, but I, I had a different impression on how it happened. He really didn't, you know, when people apologize, they say, I'm sorry. I did it. I'm sorry. Forgive me right that's an apology right but these politicians don't do that they just said well i didn't think that you cared i didn't think that that mattered or your perception of what happened is different than me or yeah that may have happened or i can't remember there's thousands of people i've taken photographs with right i've read a number of articles about teachers fondling students and uh so law enforcement can get involved, like the judicial system can get involved, but even when law enforcement doesn't get involved, the school can get involved and dismiss a teacher and go through the union and deal with that situation and dismiss someone for inappropriate behavior, right, without any prosecution of the person. But in this case, neither was done. No prosecution because we have a DA that just passed on that. In fact, it's interesting that the Appeal Democrat was so clueless. After Carl Adams gave immunity to the prostitute and then uh, was accused as possibly being a perpetrator and burning down her house because of jealousy, the Appeal Democrat wrote that that was the only blemish in 31 or 32 years of service to the county they obviously didn't know their butt from a hole in the ground people inside the office said that it was common for Carl Adams to make to when there was East Indians Punjabi people that had a problem a legal problem they committed a crime he could settle it in his office without him going to court so fascinating Wondering whether he got some money out of that somehow. Maybe a contribution to his coffer, his campaign coffer. One day I called Carl Adams. I was running a drug rehab. And we had uh, our first graduate who was a methamphetamine gal whose kids were in foster care. So she owed back child support. And so we got her her first job at near minimum wage. And uh, we're working, going to phase her out of the program into her own apartment. And so the county 
assessed half or going to garnish half her wage. I want you to imagine what, let's just pretend it's $8 an hour. And so they were going to let her try to live on $4 an hour. So I knew Carl Adams. I used to coach soccer in the same league he did. We knew each other. We had kids the same age. So I called him on the phone and I said, Hey, Carl, cause I thought, you know, it's a lot of, you know how you assume some people think the same way you do about stuff. And I thought, well, he's a Christian guy goes to church. I'm sure he has compassion on people that are trapped in addiction. And so this gal's finally clean, been doing good for a year and, um, gonna make, or make amends. So I called him and said, well, Carl, I said, Hey, I was wondering if we could get together and, and sort out a budget for this woman and have her pay back some of the money, but have enough to live on, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, no, he said, we don't do it that way. I said, well, how do you do it? I I'm new to all this. I am not an attorney. So you have to go to court. She has to go to court and she'll have to fight that taking half all her money, minimum wage. I thought, really, Carl? I mean, why not just save all that cost? It costs money to go to court, costs your attorney time, costs the judge time, costs all the paperwork. Can't we just sit down and work out a budget and just give it to the court to bless it? I know you can do that in a divorce, for instance. He said, no, you got to do it this way. So we went out and I found an attorney to represent her for no cost. And when Carl found out this guy was a good attorney and was going to actually make a case of it, he called me and this is when I answered the phone one day, I didn't know who was calling. I said, hi, Lou Benninger trauma intervention program. He said, I'm going to kick your ass. That was the first question I thought. I said, Carl, why would you say something like that to me? I'm going to kick your ass. The district attorney of Sutter County. I said, why would you say it? He said, well, you got an attorney and all that. So I said, Carl, you told me to do that. You know something, people? We've had a dirty attorney for three decades, and we got people throughout Sutter County that are dirty, that have been protected, and everybody has got their. You know, one day Bob Fischetti was here talking about when he worked went to work for a, uh, I don't think he was a clothing retailer or something, and he discovered people were stealing. In other words employees were stealing from the company and he confronted a guy and he said how come how come you didn't turn these people in and he realized that everybody was stealing so everybody had their hand in the till and so nobody was turning anybody in because everybody was dirty and so i'm i'm wondering is everybody over there in sutter county dirty or is everybody too intimidated to stand up for what's right you won't even stand up for your children, the kids in our community, being molested by an adult. Can't even do that. You you think it's more important to be called supervisor or DA or treasurer or something, something, just your, your position in the community or you're involved in Kiwanis and you're not willing to take a stand for right, right living, right thinking righteousness we just want to prosecute people that can't defend themselves but big people in the community they're they give money they their names well known we don't want we can't touch them i don't know i i i find it concerning when a school can't protect its own children you you know parents send their children to school and they can't trust that the people that are over them and you got it. You, did you know that it's a law that you have to send your children to school? That's a freaky thing right there. You got to send them and you got a molester on campus. Is that something? And then if you want to switch schools, you got to get permission. Did you know you had to get permission from the school district to switch your kid from one? You know, this is communism people. It's Soviet communism. It's, it's, it's crazy what's going on. You got to get permission from here. You got to get permission. You want to put in a window in your house. You got to get permission. You want to have a business. You got to get permission.
You got to get a certificate. You got to pay a fee. You got to have us come down and look around. That that's not, that's not freedom. That's not free enterprise. There's nothing free about enterprise in this country anymore. Everybody's wanting their hand in your pocket. You send your kids to school. You don't know what they're being taught or that the guy's keeping their hands off their rear end or their boobs or messing with them or saying something lewd to them. Over here in Marysville, we had police chiefs that couldn't keep their hands off the breasts of the women in the, in the office. Chiefs, the chiefs that go out and arrest molesters, and they got, they're got they molesting the women in the office in the Marysville Police Department. Does that like get your attention? No wonder people in jail sometimes are so irate because they know a lot of this stuff's going on and they know they did something wrong, but they said, how come I get arrested when the chief does that? Or when the cops are doing drugs, they run into them on the street. They're doing dope. Think about it. I'm not justifying people do, doing criminal activity. I'm just saying, hey, the people in authority need to be need to to at least follow the rules, follow the laws, right? We'll be right back. Santos is saying we need to let somebody else talk for a minute. This is the 30th anniversary week of the Tawana Brawley hoax but you're not gonna hear much about it in the liberal media. Mainstream journalists, after all, helped stoke hysteria about the infamous 1987 fake rape and kidnap crime. And they helped enable the toxic career of race hustling hate preacher Al Sharpton, who lied his way all the way to the top. I was a senior in high school and I'll never forget the details. Then 15-year-old Tawana Brawley was a New York teenager who went missing for four days and then was discovered on a roadside, mysteriously wrapped in a garbage bag, smeared with manure, branded with the N-word, KKK, and the word bitch scrawled in charcoal across her body. She blamed a group of white men for raping and kidnapping her. She claimed one wore a police badge. Sharpton and two other lawyer vultures targeted local county prosecutor Steve Pagonis as one of the attackers. They raised their fists, marched in the streets, cursed law enforcement, and scooped up reward money and donations. It all unraveled after a grand jury investigation, which Brawley refused to participate in, uncovered the elaborate hoax. Nearly 200 witnesses were interviewed and 6,000 pages of testimony amassed. Brawley had been in trouble with her parents. Witnesses said she was never missing, but instead was visiting a boyfriend in jail and then attended a party when she supposedly disappeared. Evidence pointed to Brawley herself scrawling the epithets on her own body. Despite claiming brutal rape and sodomy by six men over four days, there was zero forensic evidence that she was raped. Brawley and her family refused to participate in the grand jury investigation, as I pointed out. Sharpton and his fellow clowns Vernon Mason and Alton Maddox repeatedly promised proof of Tawana's tall tales, but their witnesses bailed. One of their own paid experts concluded that her appearance when she was found was consistent, quote, with self-infliction and a false allegation. A neighbor testified she saw Brawley climb into the garbage bag and lie down. Brawley skipped the legal and investigative proceedings, which concluded that the whole thing was a hoax and instead, she intended a protest rally. Years after Steve Pagonis won his defamation lawsuits against Brawley and her band of fabricators, Brawley was still insisting she was a victim, still scooping up awards and accolades, and still stiffing Pagonis of his settlement. Brawley changed her name and now works as a nurse in Virginia, defiantly fighting Pagonis' quest for justice every step of the way. Tawana and her tawdry team told rape lies and racial lies. They ruined lives and they got away with it. So, what has America learned over the last 30 years? Nothing. New race and rape hoaxes are routinely perpetuated by grifters, attention seekers, and the agenda-driven media with no consequences. Just last month, 
a black Air Force Academy cadet, admitted he faked racist epithets in his dorm to get out of trouble for other misconduct. The Academy had initially jumped to condemn racism and televised a top official's sanctimonious speech to the student body without having all the facts. They are protecting the hoaxer's identity and swept the incident under the rug. Then there's the black man who lied about being a student at Kansas State University and vandalized his own car with the N-word and death threats for public attention. Prosecutors declined to press charges a few weeks ago. Until the criminal justice system gets serious about prosecuting lying about crime as the serious crime that it is, we're in for another 30 years of Tawana Brawley's and Al Sharpton's dividing America and profiting from deceit. All right. You remember uh, when Barack Obama <clears throat> was elected, he, he came in right at the crash of our economy. Lots of problems. Remember at the tail end of the Bush years. And, uh, but the, during the eight years that Obama served, the, the, the uh, gross domestic product which if you're unfamiliar with that term, it just means the amount of goods and services that was actually produced, things you wear, things you drive, things you eat, uh, mechanisms we use to make life work, all those things together is gross domestic product. That was very small percentage every month. And the you know, they always keep track of the amount of jobs, and they always inflated those under Obama. Uh, they would never count the people that had quit looking for jobs when they count up the unemployed. So they always inflated and made it look as good as possible. <clears throat> but now since uh, Donald Trump has taken over, uh, well, let me just back up and say before Trump, there was actually an effort to shut down a lot of industries which uh, employed hundreds of thousands of people for instance the coal industry anything to do with fossil fuels so any oil exploration that was one uh, wanting to be done on federal lands permits were routinely declined because they weren't going to let oil rigs uh, search for oil or drill oil on federal lands so any of that exploration had to be done on private property or state property, which it was and, and uh, continued to flourish. But the, the Obama administration did what they could to shut down mining, uh, whether it was coal mining or mineral mining, gold, silver, copper, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and a lot of other types of industries that they didn't like. So I want to play you a clip here. Under President Trump, the U.S. economy continues to surge. Last month alone saw 40,000 new manufacturing jobs. Big number. And that's just one example. But a familiar face is trying to steal President Trump's credit. As we took these actions, we saw the U.S. economy grow consistently. We saw the longest streak of job creation in American history by far. A streak that still continues, by the way. Thanks, Obama. It's a good line. Thanks, Obama. But shouldn't we be thanking President Trump? Here to break it down is economist and University of Maryland professor Peter Morisi. Professor, thanks for joining us this morning. So you're going to see two sides of this argument. Of course, President Obama is going to kind of say, I built the ramp for this. This is my surge in the economy. President Trump saying, no, I unleashed the market through deregulation and the promise of tax reform. Who's right? President Trump, you know, President Obama reads from a very simple textbook of democratic economics. All the problems in the world are caused by Republicans, and when the Republicans are in, they cause nothing but problems. In his administration, whenever something went wrong, he blamed the legacy of George Bush. And now, with Donald Trump, is accomplishing something that President Trump just couldn't do. We're going to have three consecutive quarters of 3% growth. We haven't seen that since 2004. During the Obama period, they created jobs for sure, but it was a very slow pace, about half the pace as during the Reagan years, which, by the way, was when we last cut taxes and mm -hmm. deregulated. 
Absolutely. Well, Professor, we've got some of those stats that you talked about. We'll put them up on the screen. Almost a 30% increase in stock market value. As you mentioned, over 3% GDP growth in the last two quarters. Unemployment rate down to 4.1%, which is a 17-year low. So a thought exercise here is, would these things be happening if it was President Hillary Clinton right now? She would have, she would have continued the policies of, of her predecessor, Barack Obama. Instead, we have President Trump. So would we be seeing this growth with a different president? Absolutely not. The whole mantra of the Obama-Clinton presidency and, and, and legacy is the notion that we live in an age of limits, that the economy can't grow, that the wealthy are stealing it all, and we have to redivide a limited pie. Whereas the whole notion behind Trumponomics is let's make the pie bigger, let's create more opportunities, let's give everybody a ladder up. I like that optimism, and it's catching on in business. It wouldn't be here without President Trump. Simply, America is open for business again. The government is no longer hostile. I mean, at the rate we were going with, with Barack Obama, before you know it, it would be about as exciting here as North Korea. Uh, quick, quick final thought here. We only have a moment. Uh, Three percent growth is where we're at. Where do you see us, uh, us growing to? At a, is it four, five, six, some have said six percent. What do you think? Well, no, we're not going to grow at six percent. Four percent growth is possible during most quarters if we get some more initiatives beyond the tax cuts. We're going to have to have an infrastructure program. We're going to have to have meaningful immigration reform. And we're going to have to have some reforms in how we spend the money that we have. We're spending far too much on entitlements, which mm -hmm. is discouraging people from working. We need to find ways to enable people to get back out into the labor force. If we do those things and they're on the list, if we work down the list, if the I'd like to know they what are the, the Democrats going to do when all this growth kicks in? And what are they going to do yeah. come May when people have more money in their paycheck and the economy's growing? It's true, Professor. Do they get on the wagon uh, it, and help us get there? That becomes a tough campaign sell when the economy's growing. More, thanks for joining us, Professor. More Fox and Friends on the other side. The fact is that jobs have uh, been huge since Trump had taken over. And it's amazing. It seems like it's been years since Trump took over, but it hasn't even been one year. Do you know that? And just in that short period of time, uh, we have had more jobs created since I think 2000. Uh, that's 17 years ago now. It's an, it's been amazing. And, and so entire industries have been put back to work by reducing regulation, uh, whether it's regulation on, uh, water issues or carbon footprint or whatever. We're not talking about polluting their environment. We're talking about putting the desire to create regulations under the Obama administration. It actually just shut down entire industries. So the coal industry, they've gone back to work. And so, uh, but recently in the clip that, that I had was, uh, it was a Fox clip that interviewed, uh, an economist that explained uh, whether or not, for instance, recently Obama is taking credit for all the jobs created under Trump, suggesting that he ramped up these jobs and uh, created them. Uh, so the fact is he didn't, And uh, but I'm just going to move on since we don't have the clip. So uh, I'll leave that at that. You'll have to just trust me on that. I want to go back and talk about government waste. I started off this morning talking about Yuba County wanting more money. Marysville got away with it and is sticking, uh, screwing the people of, of Marysville and anybody passing through Marysville for 1% tax. If you're, if you live in the city of Marysville, if you buy a car anywhere in the world, you'll have to pay that extra 1%, which is no small, uh, figure, uh, on a $40,000 car, it's $400. So it's no small amount and you can't get out of it by buying it out of town because DMV fees or the use tax uh, is added depending on where you live, not where you buy. That's not true if you go buy uh, some auto parts and you buy them in Yuba City. It's 1% cheaper uh, just because of the tax. And so uh, what I wanted to talk about is government waste. And so uh, Tom Coburn, for years, he was a uh, – I believe Coburn was a gynecologist – uh, and he got elected to be a senator, I believe, from the state of Oklahoma. And Coburn sur served for many years and began putting out a book called The Book of Waste or called The Waste Book. And it, it was so popular and got so much attention on highlighting the 
the things that are almost hard to even imagine and believe that government would have the gall to spend our money this way. But I'm convinced that government uh, officials have no conscience and they don't really see it as you're in my money. They see it as just money and money that they get to spend. And therefore let's spend it this way or let's spend it that way. And they go to, they go to Congress uh, with the idea of I'm going to get some of that money for my area, even if it's stupid reasons. So uh, when Coburn retired uh, from the Senate, Jeff Flake, another senator from the state of Arizona, took it over. And he puts out uh, the waste book now. And, of course, he's now uh, going to end his term and not going to run again. But uh, maybe someone else will pick it up. But I wanted to highlight some of the things, too, because I think at the local level, you just assume, hey, I know the CAO. Hey, I know the treasurer. Hey, I know that supervisor. And they wouldn't do anything uh, that wasn't really smart and uh, efficient and effective. They would really be watching their nickels and dimes, right? But I just want to give you a sense of of how things uh are corrupted. So uh, in the waste book called, uh, the, the subtitle is Porkemon, not Pokemon, but Porkemon Go, waste book Porkemon Go. This was uh, put out in late 2016. The National Eye Institute spent, this is your money and mine, $300,000 to study boys and girls playing with Barbie dolls. Uh, Researchers literally were playing with dolls to prove what every child already knows. Girls are more likely to pl play with Barbie dolls than boys, according to Flake. <clears throat> the uh, National um, Science Foundation also spent $450,000 to research whether dinosaurs could sing. I, I, uh, I think dinosaurs were still... Uh, the last couple were around the Browns Valley area when I was born and raised, but I've never heard a dinosaur sing. I don't know whether anybody on earth has heard them sing before, <clears throat> but uh, they spent $450,000 to research whether they could sing and another one and a half million to analyze what happens to fish if they themselves end up on a treadmill. I Honestly, people, you can't come up with this stuff on your own. In a joint program between the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense, researchers spent $460,000 to have computers binge watch the television show De Desperate Housewives in an attempt to predict and understand human behavior. I won't get into the weeds on any of these because there's, there's a lot of them. I just want to cover an overview of, to give you a sense of how far we have totally lost our mind. The, the Internal Revenue Service issued a statement um, saying that we strongly disagree with the IRS wasting taxpayers' I, dollars. Did you see that? The IRS issued a statement saying we disagree with the, our own organization wasting taxpayer dollars. Yet the agency spent $12 million on an unused email archiving service. And do you do remember the uh, lowest learner being investigated before the Justice Committee in Congress and her taking the Fifth Amendment, uh, saying she didn't want to testify? And then Koskinen, the head of the IRS, saying they lost all those email hard drives were lost and eventually they were all found. You remember all that? Well, the agency spent $12 million on an unused email archiving service beginning in June 2014 because it failed to ever install the activation software. In other words, they bought it all and never did install it. Uh, Flake also classified as a waste the funds spent on public relations and advertising. You know, government spends money to promote. Just like right now, Robert Bendorf at the county of Yuba and Walter Munchheimer, the county, the city administrator of Marysville, they are, they are doing public relations and advertising to convince you that they've really been great administrators and to give them more money. So 
Flake said $1.4 billion, with a B, uh, was spent on public relations and advertising. Uh, despite the high cost of these efforts, uh, he said they didn't do much good. Only 32% of Americans surveyed expressed a favorable impression of federal government. In other words, they were spending, federal government spends money uh, touting themselves like we're really good people. You ought to like us. We do a great job here. We're working for you. You ever see those PG&E ads on uh, the Internet when you're searching the Internet? You want to look at a video or something like that on YouTube? And you'll you'll have to watch a PG&E ad saying how they're keeping you safe and stuff when they bl blew up people down in San Bruno. They just blew up somebody over here on George Washington Boulevard uh, because of a bad gas leak and and uh, they may be even attached to some of these fires in California, but they constantly have these cool people like from Sacramento or Auburn. They're all uh, regionally sensitive. So you see people that you might even know. They're saying, oh, that per that's right up the road in Auburn. And how wonderful they are shows how much they love PG&E and all that. Anyway, same thing with government. So they take your money and they spend it to convince you that they're wonderful. So... Let me, uh, let me just give you a quick overview of things that uh, the Porkemon Waste Book. So they spent $1.7 million for a comedy club starring holograms of dead comedians. They spent $74 million for a program that allows taxpayer-backed loans to be repaid with peanuts, literally peanuts. In other words, if you're a peanut grower, I guess you could – you could just give a product back instead of money, right? And then they'll go sell, give the product away or make peanut butter out of it. The government. $1.5 million went to test the endurance of a fish on a treadmill, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, $5 million went to study the partying habits of fraternities and sororities. Four hundred and uh, I did that one. $3.5 million to learn why people are afraid of going to the dentist. I could tell them that. 817,000 to study monkey drool, D R O O L, drool. 3.4 million for hamster cage fight matches. Not quite sure what the conclusion to that matter would have been. 300,000 to study if girls and boys spend more time playing with Barbie dolls. I mentioned that earlier. 450,000 to determine if dinosaurs could sing. And $12 million for an IRS unused uh, email service. Now, that's just the uh, highlights. This is a 200-page book, 200 pages of your money. I want you to think about that. When, when your money, like right now they just passed a tax reform act with quotes around reform. Have you, you know, it shouldn't be, let's see, what, in, is it January or February you'll get your 10 40 book or something like that. They don't, maybe they don't even send books out anymore. We were going to go all electronic, but the last time they were sending books out, that book was about three eighths of an inch thick, more than a quarter of an inch. It wasn't a half inch. <clears throat> so complicated, all gimmicked, right? Well, if you do this, then you conduct this. Well, if you do this and you don't make over this amount, then you conduct just total complication and crazy foolishness uh, to just file your taxes. Oh, here's a, let, let me give you these, uh, final ones. And then, uh, I'll let you look up the waste book. It's actually online. The entire book, you can download it and you can read the whole book. Uh, let me just check something out here and then I want to, let, let me, just explain this is incredible during the, remember the ebola outbreak when remember obama he was flying ebola infected people to the united states he just did that to irritate you right because they could have treated him anywhere but they actually flew people and you remember the gal that got sick from uh i it was a vietnamese nurse in was it texas or somewhere some state she was taking care of this guy that they flew in from some Ebola infested nation, maybe Liberia or something like that. And she got sick and then she sued the hospital. But during the 2014 Ebola outbreak, the director of the national institutes of health 
stated in an interview that if we had just not gone through ten, a 10-year ten slide in research support, right, all these people mooching off the government, we probably would have had a vaccine for Ebola. Did you know that? In other words, he was complaining that they didn't get enough money from the government. Well, following that claim, Jeff Flake, current senator from, a uh, senior senator from Arizona, and the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Africa and Global Health, he began to do a little investigation on that comment from that guy, blaming that they didn't get enough money or, or they would have had an Ebola vaccine. And uh, he found that the agency, the National Institute of Health, had actually spent $32 billion of our taxpayer money. That's their annual budget. And that search of this guy complaining that if they would have just give them more money, they would have had an Ebola vaccine. Here's what they spent $32 million billion with a B. Why some, here's, these are projects. Why some people see Jesus face on toast. You know, toast when you take bread and put it in a little thing and it toasts it toast. I guess some people see, I've never seen Jesus face on toast or any other kind of meal I was eating, but they spent $3.5 million studying that. And then why a uh, drunk bird slur, or if they do slur when they sing, you know how we slur when we get drunk and try to sing, do drunk birds do that? Does cocaine make honeybees dance? So $5 million for the birds, $243,000 for the bees. How about this? What type of music do monkeys and chimpanzees prefer to listen to? That costs us a million dollars. Why is yawning contagious? That's another million dollars. This is the National Institute of Health. So within the budgets of the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, Flake found more questionable studies that sought to answer questions such as, where does it hurt most to be stung by a bee? One million. Why does walking with coffee cause it to spill? 172,000. Are cheerleaders more attractive in a squad or on their own? 1.1 million. Who will be America's next top model? <coughs> 2.9 million. What makes goldfish feel sexy? 3.9 million. Think about that for a second. When you hear congressmen saying, if we have tax reform, people will die, and we're spending money studying the sexual behavior of goldfish and cheerleaders and who the top, top model is and what type of music monkeys like and does cocaine make a honeybee dance? Are, are, are you wanting to believe these people that say people are going to die because we have tax reform and we're cutting taxes? The other fascinating thing to me is this concept that we can never cut the taxes on rich people. You can say that in other words. We can never cut the taxes on people that pay the taxes. Do you know that almost 50% of Americans, adult Americans, don't pay any tax? Any, I'm talking about income tax. They don't make enough because of all the deductions, etc., to pay any income tax. So that means they live in America, are protected, collect welfare, get all the benefits, WIC, Section 8, da-da-da-da-da, all these benefits, hundreds of thousands of dollars in benefits, free education, and pay no tax at all, income tax. But then they complain if people that pay income tax get a cut in taxes. If that isn't what they call class warfare, I don't know what is. So we're going to take a break. And we're going to be back to land this plane. Do you 
want a good California governor who will veto bad bills? I'm Randy Thomason with your SaveCalifornia.com Minute. In six short months, every candidate for California governor will be eliminated, except the top two that survive our dysfunctional jungle primary. And it looks like the top two will be Liberal Democrats Gavin Newsom and Antonio Villaraigosa, unless Republicans coalesce around one conservative candidate. A new poll has Republicans John Cox at 9% and Travis Allen at 6%. If either man drops out, the remaining Republican could inherit a combined 15 percent. Then in light of 30 percent of voters being undecided, he could fight hard to surpass the second place Democrat and win a spot in the November election. See what you can do at SaveCalifornia.com. Fighting the good fight for your values in California. It's my tremendous honor to finally wish America and the world a very Merry Christmas. From the earliest days of our nation, Americans have known Christmas as a time for prayer and worship, for gratitude and goodwill, for peace and renewal. For Christians, this is a holy season, the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Christmas story begins 2,000 years ago with a mother, a father, their baby son, and the most extraordinary gift of all, the gift of God's love for all of humanity. Whatever our beliefs, we know that the birth of Jesus Christ and the story of this incredible life forever changed the course of human history. At Christmas time, we recognize that the real spirit of Christmas is not what we have. It's about who we are. Each one of us is a child of God. And so this Christmas, we ask for God's blessings for our family, for our nation. And we pray that our country will be a place where every child knows a home filled with love, a community rich with hope, and a nation blessed with faith. God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas is, well, it's about the best time of the whole year. You walk down the streets, even for weeks before Christmas comes. And there's lights hanging up, green ones and red ones. Sometimes there's snow, and everybody's hustling someplace. But they don't hustle around Christmas time like they usually do. You know, they're a little more friendly. They bump into you, they laugh, and they say, pardon me, and Merry Christmas. And especially when it gets real close to Christmas night. Everybody's walking home, you can hardly hear a sound. Bells are ringing, kids are singing. Snow is coming down, and boy, what a pleasure it is to think that you got some place to go to. And the place that you're going to has somebody in it that, that you really love. Someone you're nuts about. Merry Christmas. Ladies and gentlemen, we usually don't step out of character, but tonight I think it proper that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cramden and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Norton wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Would you come in there, Norton? There they are. That's the uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. If you ever desire to go to New York, the, the place you need to go if you skip everything else is Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's an amazing church. 
Uh, I was in uh, one of the team to Queens, New York one time to work on the streets for a week uh, with people, addicts and stuff. And so uh, I took time to go to a church in Harlem uh, one Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> then the middle of the week, the guy that uh, ran the operation uh, and over, he was one of the, the leaders of Elam Bible Institute in upstate New York. Anyway, he took, uh, I went with him. He was going to speak at Brooklyn Tabernacle. So uh, I tagged along with him, and uh, I got to hear this choir. And if you ever get a chance to go to this, one of the great churches in the city of New York, in Brooklyn, of course, Brooklyn Tabernacle. So uh, they got some amazing singers. You know, one thing about New York, because uh, there's so many plays and um, professional musicians there in the churches of New York, big churches like in the one in Harlem, uh, a lot of the people are professional jazz players and playing in the, uh, the worship group. So pretty cool. I wanted to finish by just making a few comments about, um, all this discussion about deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, you hear this DACA and, uh, or you hear this term dreamers, which sounds very good and wonderful and how wonderful these people are that are in this country What's left out of it is they're illegal, and uh, I, I'm getting ready to go to Vietnam, and so every time I go to Vietnam, i got to make sure I have a, 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 uh, a current visa. Uh, and if I don't have a current visa and I get there in the airport, they'll just turn me around and say, get on the next plane and uh, leave. That's it. It's, it's pretty clear. Or you get uh, picked up in Vietnam without proper paperwork or communist China or Laos, and they will just put you, they'll incarcerate you. It's not a very complicated thing at all, but straightforward. So uh, these people, let me just, I'm going to cover some facts. Here. There's a lot of misinformation about dreamers. Uh, that's a term that Obama administration came, came up with. The Obama administration came up with this concept of deferred action for children, childhood arrivals. In other words, in other words, we're, yeah, they're illegal, but we're, we're still sorting out what we're going to do with them because they couldn't arbitrarily make a decision to give them amnesty without Congress involved. And remember, Obama did lots of stuff without, he just did with a stroke of a pen, said, I don't need to go to Congress, right? So uh, there's a guy that writes for the Heritage Institute, and his name is Hans von Spakovsky. The cool thing about Hans is he's very bright. And he writes about this and kind of parses out the details of it. Said Democrats portray DACA program as only benefiting those who were a few years old, tiny little kids when they came to the U.S. illegally, leaving them unable to speak their native language and ignorant about their old country's cultural norms. Therefore, the reasoning goes it would be a hardship to return these illiterate uh, people that belong to no country. In other words, they belong more to the U.S. than they belong to their home country, right? Obama himself gave this rationale when he and the DACA beneficiaries were brought to this country by their parents as infants. Remember, he used the term infants. And he says they face deportation to a country that they know nothing about. This is exact quote from Obama. And with a language they can't even speak. I feel so bad for them. Well, Spakovsky says, while this may be true of a very small portion of this population, it certainly is not true of all of the aliens who received administration amnesty. In other words, under the DACA concept, a lot of people got amnesty and they didn't fit into this bracket in fact illegal aliens were eligible to be daca people as as long as they came to the u.s before their 16th birthday so they weren't just like toddlers being packed in on mom's back they were 15 year old toddlers 15 year olds plus 11 months toddlers uh and as long as they were under 31 years of age of June 15, 2012. So if people came in before their 16th birthday and as of June 15, 2012, they were uh, still under 31 years of age. Those are not little kids. They could file for DACA. 
Now, right out here at Yuba College, they're giving people uh, DACA exemptions. They pay. You and I are paying for their tuition, and then they're actually paying for them to pay uh, DACA application fees, permit fees, which cost about four hundred fifty dollars a piece. Right? We're paying it out of our you and my money that we. If you if you own property in Yuba and Sutter or Calusa or Butte counties or any anybody that's paying bonds to Yuba College, you're paying part of your bonds for DACA kids. So it says DACA also required that beneficiaries enroll in school, graduate from high school, obtain a GED certificate, or receive an honorable discharge from the military, have no conviction for a felony or significant misdemeanor, or three or more other misdemeanors, minor misdemeanors, and not pose a threat to national security or public safety. So in other words, they had to be a good citizen even though they weren't citizens, right? So you and I, if you were born here or became a citizen, we could commit all the crimes we want, and they can't throw us out of the country. There, we're, our, we're stuck here. We're, uh, we're here to stay. But if you're not a citizen of this country and you commit a crime, the government can ask you or just tell you we're, you're moving, right? We're flying you out. We're bussing you out. We're, we're sending you over the border somewhere. However, the Obama administration didn't follow its own rules. They routinely waived the education requirement. Only 49% of DACA beneficiaries, remember these little tiny kids when they came in, that now could be up to 31 years of age as of June 15, 2012. 40, only 49% of them have a high school education. Uh, despite that, despite the fact that majority are adults then how thorough were they vetted remember they had to have a clean background no no crimes right in february 2017 after the arrest of a daca beneficiary for gang membership the department of homeland security admitted that at least 1500 daca beneficiaries had their eligibility terminated due to criminal conviction gang affiliation or criminal conviction related to gang affiliation then by august 2017 that number of daca people had surged that had their eligibility terminated because they're criminals to 2139 people additionally daca only excluded individuals for convictions in other words they could have committed crimes but didn't actually proceed to a conviction And still stay. DACA had no requirement of English fluency either. In fact, the original application requested applicants to answer whether the form had been read to the alien by a translator in a language in which the applicant is fluent. If you're going to apply to be DACA, I thought you had to speak English. But obviously that didn't count. So you see what the government tells you isn't always the facts just like we were talking about earlier today about financing and budget and whether they're out of money. The Center for Immigration Studies estimates that perhaps 24% of DACA-eligible population fall into the functionally illiterate category, and another 46% have only basic English ability. It's a far cry, isn't it, from the image of DACA beneficiaries as all children who don't speak the language of their former country did they speak any language they couldn't speak english they couldn't speak spanish or some other language what they speak we just got lied to by the obama obama administration the other thing if you've been hearing about these uh chain my migration let me help you with this the average immigrant has sponsored 3.45 additional immigrants but for daca beneficiaries that number is likely to be much higher that's because according to analysis by the department of homeland security 76 percent of daca beneficiaries were from mexico mexican immigrants sponsor an average of 6.38 additional legal immigrants that's called chain immigration one person gets in as soon as they get in then they say i'm the reason that all these other people are, need to come in because now because you let me be a citizen of this great country now i'm separated from a whole family you screwed my life up 
It's the highest rate of any nationality for chain migration. That's why the president wants to end chain migration. <clears throat> Before I go on, I wanted to uh, mention again a couple sponsors. Oh, I want to mention again, uh, I didn't even mention this today. Law Enforcement Pie Day is coming up next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, September 7th, or September 7th, uh, December 17th, Sunday. And what that is, if you're not familiar with it, is if you donate $10 towards Stevens Farmhouse, it's a, they bake a lot of good stuff, plus they sell some farm produce out on uh, 6219. I call it Highway 99. They call it Sawtell. It's on the way to Sacramento from Yuba City, south of town. You can give $10, and they will bake a fresh pie of a variety of different flavors, and they will deliver it to a law enforcement person from one of four counties, Yuba, Sutter, Calusa, or Butte. They're going to have a big event uh, a week from tomorrow at 9 in the morning, going to serve breakfast over at the Veterans Center in Yuba City at the corner of Butte House Road and Civic Center Boulevard. And then they're going to present pies to all these folks, maybe 1,200 pies, something like that. And then any money left over, they're going to donate to the Cascade Fire victims up there in the foothills of Yuba County, which will be really cool. Last year they raised over $7,000. They gave extra. They made extra. People just donated to the cause, and they gave it instead of – they gave the pies to law enforcement, but the cash they gave to a, an operation called Restoration Railroad – to fight human trafficking this year maybe about that much money will go to the cascade fire victims which they could use some help up there so if you want to get in on this and say you'd like to do something say something kind to law enforcement you could uh if you don't know how to reach out to law enforcement you just say give ten dollars to stevens farmhouse or more and you can do that by calling 673-0406 and hooking up, drive down there. They might even take your credit card over the phone. If you mail something down there, you can mail something to Stevens Farmhouse at 6219 Sawtell, S-A-W-T-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Yuba City 95991. And that'll be good. And this should be a great event. This is the third year they've done it. Uh, Jeff and Cherie Stevens are good folks, and they – the, uh, God bless them for coordinating this good effort. So another reminder that the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots will not be meeting until the 14th of January uh, because <clears throat> their normal meeting date of the 1st and 3rd. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I said the 14th of January. It's the, it's the 15th. Sorry. 15th of January. Uh, the 14th is Sunday. So because they're the first uh the first of the month is is actually uh new year's day that ain't gonna work so the 15th they'll be back in business on uh the third monday of the month and at six thirty at church of glad tidings go check that out and get involved start off the year you know one thing i know is we always have tip training in february which we're going to do this year uh, late February, the last Thursday of February, we're going to launch. And the reason we do that is people kind of do New Year's resolutions. They kind of, after they got done with all the holidays, things mellow out, quiet down, and they can start off new stuff, add new stuff to their life. So maybe a new thing would be you getting involved with the Sutter Beach Tea Party Patriots. That would be cool. And get active in our community. Learn more about it. You can't really do much unless you know what you're doing and know what's going on. They will help you do that. So on the 15th, you could go to your first meeting, and then if you want to get involved with TIP, you can dial us up at 673-9300. You've heard a commercial or so today about that. If you want to go out on 911 calls and help people, uh, you could check it out uh, in late February, the last Thursday of the month. We're going to we're going to launch that operation, and uh, so let's see. I think it's the 22nd maybe of the month. You can look it up on our website at yubasuttertip.org, yubasuttertip.org. And let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention is about, uh, you know, uh, you heard that Tammy uh, 
Laren talk about welfare and jobs, and she's talked about the need for people to go to work. And if you want a job, you want to go to work, you want to go into the security business, you can go to um, EliteUniversalSecurity.com and uh, check out the jobs there, Elite universalsecurity.com or you could call them up at 7490280 they do all kind of guard work but they also have office workers they got lots of different workers they got people working on cars they got all kinds of vehicles just like law enforcement does and if you want to take classes to get become a guard or you want to be take classes maybe you want to go into law enforcement you could check out API Academy it's API hyphen uh, dot, uh, sorry, api-academy.com and check out all the classes and the schooling they got going on. And, uh, you know, just when you get some schooling under your belt, it just opens up all kinds of cool opportunities and they got classes. Some of your, those classes just would help you with self-defense, like shooting somebody that's bugging you, like get how to handle a firearm. Maybe you're a little intimidated. And you're like a female and he's like, I don't like to go out after dark because I'm, I'm afraid. Just get a little pistol, get you some little training. And uh, you can even learn how to handle pepper spray. Uh, you could tase people. You could like get it on out there. So api-academy.com or 7490280. So let's see. Okay. I don't know whether you noticed. Uh, I don't know whether I can find this really quick before we shut down here. But um, Mitt Romney, who isn't serving in any political office, is running around trying to, like, straighten everybody else out. Did you notice that? And uh, – I wonder how come who is Mitt representing anyway? He's not really a Republican, uh, and anyway, it's he was down there in Judge Moore's area trying to hose Judge Moore down. Let me see if I can find this. Oh, I've, and uh, he was telling everybody that they shouldn't, they should elect this Democrat. Oh, Jones, who's pro-abortion. You notice all these Republicans don't care much. They don't mind abortion, killing kids. I just get a kick out of that. They just don't mind killing kids. Then they got all concerned about other stuff that doesn't make any difference one way or the other. Uh, but he's down there trashing Judge Moore. And, uh, but he ran into an old friend of ours uh, by the name of Stephen Bannon, who is now back working for Breitbart and Bannon took Mitt on. Did you know that Mitt skipped out on the v Vietnam War? So he he said, you know, uh, Bannon, you're down here trashing Judge Moore, who actually served in Vietnam, was decorated over there in Vietnam. But it it seems that Mitt Romney, uh, he doesn't even belong in Alabama, is down there trying to like tell people how to vote, and tell how this is going to be a stain on the on the party, but he accused Mitt of skipping out on the war and going out on what little mission for the Mormon church. I think he went to France. Uh, and so Bannon reminded Mitt that Judge Moore is a graduate of the United States military, military Academy at West Point, served the country in one of the toughest wars ever, ever fought in Vietnam, and talked about what honor and integrity really was and uh so then he said mitt got a college deferment and uh, then did you know mitt had five sons five he's got a big family mitt but not one of those had time to serve in the military did you know that and so uh that's kind of a he said you know he talked about having over fifty thousand lost in vietnam and then we had seven thousand dead in iraq and afghanistan fifty two thousand casualties but not a romney was out there risking their life but judge moore was so uh 
it's interesting, Mitt Romney, who was just about as weak an individual as you could find. The dude knows how to make money, but we don't need people to know how to make money. You know something? We need honest people who actually want to follow the Constitution. Did you know that Mitt basically created Obamacare for Massachusetts? You know, the go there's nothing in the Constitution about the government being involved in your health. Did you know that? Or telling you what to eat? Do you remember we talked last week about Michelle Obama telling kids what they had to eat? Forbidding kids to eat certain things. Can you imagine America? We say this is a free country, and we have the president's wife forbidding students in our government schools. They're Soviet schools is all they are. They're just Soviet schools in America telling them what they can and cannot eat. You, you can't have, remember that? Schwarzenegger, I think, even removed the sodas off campus, right? And uh, so they can't keep drugs off campus, but they can control the sodas. So uh, this is, so we got Romney running around trying to control more. And did you hear that the woman who accused more of all these things has now come out to be a full blown liar. Did you catch that? I don't know whether you caught that deal. I did. I don't know whether I can, uh, how much time I have here. Did I couple, I got three minutes. Okay. Honestly, they forged that. You remember the yearbook that Gloria Allred showed up with this woman and showed Moore's hand, his, you know how you sign yearbooks when you, maybe you signed a yearbook, maybe you didn't. When I got out of school, some people said, will you sign my yearbook or make a comment in my yearbook? So somehow Moore signed her yearbook, but he really didn't. And he signed it as DA, but he wasn't the DA. And she forged his signature. And uh, in other words, the woman is a liar and so is Gloria Allred. So it's just something to think about. Uh, we're not going to get to vote. If you're a Californian and listen to this, you're not going to get to vote on this anyway. But there's a lot of foolishness going on on this uh, race. It's funny. I mean, I think women should come out and stand up and take people down. But when people have not done anything, when he's run twice for uh, Supreme Court of Alabama and t they had all that opportunity to come out then but then just a couple weeks before the election they come out it just seems a little odd i don't know it just seems odd to me maybe maybe he did do something uh i don't know uh there was less of a spread between ages on him if anything was true him and the in the girl than there was between clinton and his girl in the white house i mean there's all you know the democrats want to play the double standard thing like crazy so uh, anyway, uh, we're about ready to wrap it up. I think we got the sports guys coming in here today. They'll entertain you with like, they'll clue you in on how to sort out the, all the sports controversies. I'm just learning about this, the NFL union, who is basically typical union. They're a bunch of communists and they support all kinds of things that most of you don't even agree with. Uh, they supported Hillary Clinton, the, you know, the NFL union, the ones that are backing all these guys protesting this, the national anthem, they're protesting because they don't believe in America, right? They don't want to go to war. They don't want to support any of that. They voted for Hillary. So that's why the, the, you know, why don't you just, you love football, but you won't know the rest of their life. You don't know what, what they really believe. You don't want to know that. Uh, we're done. We'll see you next week.